Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a great opportunity, a wonderful opportunity to speak here. Uh, I want to thank Doug and the, all the members of the Caring Center and the video crew for this uh, wonderful chance because I have the great privilege of presenting to information tonight that hasn't really been put out in the public a lot. And it stems from my work as a research scientist. Basically, my work was involved with cloning human muscle cells. I was working with dystrophic patients and taking out human cells and trying to understand what the control mechanisms were that were providing for the pathological expression of the cell. And I was doing this while teaching in medical school, as Doug said. The interesting thing was this. After my years of research, I started to recognize something that some of our current beliefs and our, our truths about medicine are actually not very correct at all that there's a revolution going on in the healthcare uh, area, but it's at the leading edge of research. And where I was working at that end, I found that it really should come down to the people. It's really more important for you to understand because the information I'm going to present tonight is very, very self-empowering information because it really reveals that we've had some very well, assumptions, and I'm going to list them for you. And you know the definition of assume uh, that uh, that we have been we've really been messed up by some some ideas that are not absolutely correct. And now, if I try to correct them and present them to you with an understanding of how biology works, which is relatively simple because nature is simple in how she does everything. Once I explain this, and you really start to see how powerful you have been, but how limited you have been because of alterations in our belief about how powerful we've been. That we've held some very important beliefs that have been transmitted from science to the public. And the issue about that is in converting the scientific information into public words, a lot of the meaning has been shifted around and it's not exactly the truth. So there's a, a thing that you've heard about genetic determinism, for example, that you are controlled by genes. And during the first hour of this presentation tonight, what I really want to show you is the, the, other, the other truth, that there is a truth that's, that says that, in fact, that you're not controlled by genes. You're actually controlled by your perceptions of the environment. And as we'll talk about, perceptions mean beliefs. And the significance about this is that when we talk about genes, and uh, we talk about genetic uh, illnesses or genetic predispositions, let me give you an important factoid first. Indeed, there are things called genetic defects, and they affect about 5% of the population. Well, what I'm really trying to address is this. It's the 95% of the population that got here with wonderful genes and were capable in all ways being biologically sound, and yet end up uh, expressing illnesses and cancers and early death and cardiovascular diseases. And there's a tendency, of course, for us to put this emphasis and onus on the genes. But it turns out, no, it really turns out that it's how the genes are selected and rewritten by our belief systems. I was working on cloning these cells, and what I started to recognize was that because part of my experiment was uh, destroying the DNA and watching the behavior of the cell. And the, and the surprising part is, is that you can destroy all the DNA and the cell still has a life and it still has behavior. And the belief is if DNA is controlling the cell, then what's controlling the cell after all the DNA is gone? Well, this is what led me to an understanding of the real brain of the cell, which is what the subject of this movie is going to be about, ultimately. And then basically what I started to recognize was that uh, I got really excited about it because it's like, oh my God, this is a whole new understanding of science at the time. And uh, I started to go out and lecture about it. And it was real exciting because uh, the conventional people, my colleagues and peers, all understood it, but they were still wary of it because we've invested so much money in the belief of genes and drugs that it was real hard for them to, to shift midstream and start to look at other alternative beliefs. And so the significance about it was this, is that for the first two years, I was all excited going out, talking to people, and telling them about, God, this is a great understanding. If you really understand this stuff, how powerful it is on your life and how you can change your life. And then I started recognizing people look at me and go, you know, Bruce, this is a great story, but your life doesn't look so great to me. And I realized the truth, and this was the important part about it, was we always put, we think that if we just take this academic information in our head, then all of a sudden our lives are going to change. It's sort of like, a, it's like an academic pill. If I take the pill, I'm going to be better. And I realized at some point, and especially when I almost heard myself say to these people, I said, well, do as I say, not as I do. And I realized at some point, well, how can I be talking about this great stuff and yet not applying it to my life? And that's when I realized at some point I said, okay, let's not talk about this anymore until you go out and actually try to live that way. So the beautiful part about it is now, 15 years into this, it only took me a few months to start to recognize the change, but here's a simple reality. I left a world that if I was going to live in it and give it a title, I would have called it maybe purgatory at best. 
and now I find myself living in heaven on a day-by-day -day basis to recognize this, that we have a great influence over the unfoldment of our lives, but we have never really been given clarification of how that influences our lives. And so the significance of this is real in that I can provide you with this information, you can walk away with the information, but there's a point where actually you have to start participating in it, like I had to do it, and start to incorporate it into our lifestyle because we can change belief. What's unusual about these women? And what's unusual about these women are their ages. And if you check out the ages of these women, Dorothy at 75 years old is dancing every night in the Palm Springs Follies. The minimum age to get in the Follies is 55 years of age. The significance about these women is, of course, first of all, you notice the vitality that they have. You'll also probably recognize at some point that they don't get affected by the same things that other people experience as they get older. And so what is the issue that gives them this vitality? This is the basic question. Our conventional understanding is that genes provide for this. So all of us hear all the time in newspaper articles, on television and media, about genes controlling this and genes controlling that. And the relevance is that we have come to believe a concept called genetic determinism. The significance of genetic determinism is this. It is a belief that says that at the moment of conception, when the sperm and egg came together, the genes were selected for your life, and that the rest of your life unfolds from the reading of these genes. Well, there's a problem with that, and the problem with it is this. If it is true, then we become victims of our heredity, don't we? What do, how can we get out of the genes? They're in, built into us. We can't get out of it. And then also something else happens. We become irresponsible. The reason is this. If the genes are making me do these things and I can't change my genes, then what is it that I can do with my life except make sure I probably get the proper medication to make me feel better through the process? And the issue comes down to this point, that this assumption is an assumption, <laughs> that it's not true, that genes do not control who you are. And yet I will have to go through this by going through the fact that there are three assumptions that science is based on that are totally wrong at this time. And these three assumptions include assumption number one. This is assumption that says that biological processes employ Newtonian mechanics. What does that mean? It means this. According to the Newtonian world, the Newtonian vision, the universe is a machine that is made out of physical parts. And that if you understand how the physical parts interact, you can understand everything about the machine. And that there's no room for energy in there. It's only physical parts. So the relevance is this. By the belief in Newtonian physics, medicine does not entertain the notion that energy is involved in the healing process. Of course, Newtonian physics is out of date now by 75 years because we entered the quantum era in 1925, and yet medicine is still stuck in the biological uh, Newtonian phase. And I'm going to talk about this in the second half of the talk. The second assumption is what I'm going to spend most of the talk on for the first part. The second assumption is based on this, that genes control biological expression. Well, I'm going to show you exactly the absolute chemical truth that genes cannot control biological expression for a very simple reason. Genes can't turn themselves on and they can't turn themselves off. So the genes aren't controlling themselves, they can't control anything else either. And I'll explain where the control comes from. And third, the assumption that Darwinian evolution provided for the existence of the bio biosphere as we see it. This again is another uh, mistake in our assumption that in fact that uh, it is not a Darwinian process that got us here. It's more of a, what we call a Lamarckian process and the relevance of that is that organisms always match their environment and as the environments change, the organisms change to adapt to those environments. Well, what does that mean about yourself? What environments are you living in and what are your belief systems? They become very important because what we find now is that your genes will adapt to your beliefs and this becomes a very, very critical part, uh, part of our understanding about life here. So I want to start off with the original mission statement of science, and that was based on a belief before 1600s that God and spirit infused the physical world. And so they had a mission statement. There were scientists before the 1600s, and this was their mission statement, to gain an understanding of the natural order so that we can live in harmony with it. And that was a nice, beautiful concept that by studying in nature, if we see how it all fits together and all the pieces fit together, then maybe we would be able to fit together better in that picture and survive in, in a much better way than we were doing it. So science's effort was to understand the mechanisms of the universe in regard to the spiritual nature of it. However, around 1600 is when the modern scientific revolution occurred. People like Descartes, people like Isaac Newton, 
got involved and they looked at the universe and said, you know, I, it, it, there might be a God out there, but we don't need God to explain this because it works like a clockwork mechanism. And that's where Newton got involved and he, with his mathematics was able to map out the movements of the planets and the sun. And obviously then he said, look, it's a machine. I can predict everything about it. Well, that then relate to biology because when we got to biology, we began to look at the body not from an outside spiritual influence, but we started to look inside the body because we said the body is a machine and it's just like the universe. And if we understand the machine, we can fix and adjust the machine. So science took a different approach. Rather than trying to live in harmony with life, this is the mission statement that current modern science is involved with, to obtain knowledge that can be used to dominate and control nature. The point is, at least at the, at the good concept of it is, well, if you got here and you had something defective or you were unhealthy or you were getting disease, then if we could control your body, we can control your health and the disease, and therefore we could provide you with health. So basically, you have to dominate and control nature to do this. So the issue is, I mean, first of all, just think of that silly nature that humans are going to control nature. Well, I mean, we always think big, and obviously that's one of the thoughts. And the reality is then what to control nature is we have to look at the human cell. Here's an important part that I learned from my research on cells and what I used to teach medical students. And that's a very interesting point. You are made out of anywhere from 50 to 70 trillion cells in your body. You're actually a community of cells. I used to clone people's cells, take them out and put them in a culture dish. And sometimes, in fact, many times the cells grew better in the culture dish than they grew in the individual, meaning that the environment was altering the reflection of the cells. Well, here's the point that I was teaching, and it's an important point for you to understand. With all this magnificent machinery that we call the human body, there is no new function that's present in your human body that's not already present in every single cell. You have a digestive system, a respiratory system, an excretory system, a nervous system. So does the cell. And the relevance of that is, is that by taking the cell apart, we hope to find the nervous system for the simple reason is this. In order to pursue the mission statement of science is what? To control? Well, then we have to look at the organ that controls, and that is the brain and the nervous system. Well, we study the human, but it gets too complex. That's why if we study the cell, it's a lot easier. And so most of the advances in medical science are actually work from studying individual cells because the function of the cell and the life of the cell is almost identical to us. But how do we understand how do we attack this problem? How do we go and investigate cells? Well, we use science. The science that we use is Newtonian mechanisms. Remember I said currently biology uses Newtonian mechanisms. Well, there are three aspects of Newtonian mechanisms that are very important. Number one, the belief in materialism. The fact is this, according to Newtonian mechanics, Everything that's worth studying is physical because they don't believe that anything else is out there besides the physical wor the world. The, it's just parts. So all that matters is matter. So in looking at a body, you look at the parts of the body. Number two, bodies are complex things. And, and there's a way of understanding complex things because if you look back at the body, you say, how can something work? Look how complex it is. And the answer is, there's an approach in Newtonian mechanics called reductionism. And reductionism is this concept, that if something is complicated, you take it apart and you study the individual pieces, and when you study the pieces, you can assemble them in an order and then understand how they work, and therefore you understand how complex things work. The analogy that's often used is the analogy of a watch. If I found this watch and I didn't know how it worked, what would I do? And the answer is I would take it apart. And once I take it apart, I start to find that gear A turns gear B turns gear C. And then I start to create a flow chart. A goes to B goes to C to D, etc. And here's the point. If you bring me your watch and it's not working right, then what would I do? I would take it apart, look at all the parts, A, B, C, and D. And if there's a part that's not right or not working right, I can take that part out and replace it with a new part. Well, the relevance is this is your body and we can take it apart and look at the pieces. And if your body's not working right, then what will we do? We'll take it apart and put new parts in. And if we put new parts in, then we can control the outcome, and that's called determinism. That's the third leg of the Newtonian philosophy. The fact is this, if I know how the parts work, then conceivably, if I make new parts, I can put it into the machine, and then I can control the machine by altering the parts. And so basically, by determinism, we mean that you come in sick, and I say, which part's wrong? I give you a drug, stick it in your body, and all of a sudden, you feel all, fed, all better again because we can predict the outcome through a process called determinism. And that leads us to this understanding. This is from Judy Olawson's book called Mother's Little Helpers. Uh, this, this picture here shows uh, the Valium 
bottle sitting right there, the proverbial mother's little helper. And the relevance about it is this. As you notice, every 15 minutes on television, there's ads from the drug companies. And not only are they telling you now that they can fix parts of you, arthritis, pains, and aches, but they also say, hey, you having a bad day? You're having a tough time? You got a little anxiety? We got pills for you. And the issue is very important here is because the whole aspect of medical research is based on the drive by the drug company. It's the drug company that profits from the research because then when we understand how things work, they make the parts and then you buy the parts. Except sometimes there's a lot of errors in that. And I'll give you a big one that's affecting the population right now. There was a study done in North Carolina and it revealed that more than 50% of the children taking Ritalin for attention deficit disorder don't have attention deficit disorder. I mean, in other words, we're over-prescribing the drugs. And the problem is it's not the drugs that are the answers to the issues and that we have to look for another answer. So we get out from this drug model. So I have to explain to you how cells work. And this is a beautiful part because it's not very complex. The complexity comes in the number of pieces. And the pieces that I'm going to talk about are the proteins, that you have approximately 100,000 protein parts that make up your body. And these are just like machine parts. And the reality is that these 100,000 parts work together and carry out the life functions. They don't look like the machines that we're used to. They have weird looking shapes to them. They look organic. Of course, they're organic parts. They're amorphic looking. They don't look like sheet metal and screws and nuts and bolts. They look like things like this. Now, at the top of the picture in white is, a, is an AIDS virus. At the bottom of the picture in white is the surface of a human cell that the blue structure is a protein attached to the AIDS virus, and the red structure is a protein that's on the surface of every one of your cells. And the idea is that the virus cannot attach to your cells unless the blue protein of the virus complements and plugs in like a lock and key to the red protein on your cell. Now, when you look at this little bubbly-looking protein, you might think, well, that's just this little organic chewing gum kind of thing or something. But the truth is this. These are as accurate as machine parts as any human machines we've ever made. That the fact is that this same red protein is the very same on every one of your cells, because if it wasn't, you wouldn't be able to be affected by the AIDS virus. So my point is for you to recognize that machines don't always look like the machines that we see, but they have an organic look. Look to them. This is another organic machine. There you can see a helix, the orange, I mean the yellow and the magenta is a DNA double helix. But in purple and blue and green and orange, that's a protein machine. Again, you look at it and you say, well, that's a machine? And the answer is yes. It actually screws down the length of the DNA, and at the front where the arrow is, it, that, that protein machine adds new pieces to the DNA to extend the length of the DNA. So my point, again, is look at this, but recognize these organic things are actually machines. So here's a picture of a protein on the left and a picture of the protein on the right. It's the same protein. And the point about it is this. Underneath the structure of a protein is a backbone. The backbone gives the shape to the protein. Remember when we were young and you went into school and your teacher said, draw a person. What, what kind of person did you actually draw? A stick figure, right? With the backbone and the shape. That's what gave the shape. And then when you got older, you fleshed out the stick figure. Well, the point about it is this. The protein on the right is the stick figure, and the one on the left is the fleshed out version of the same thing. So there, underneath, there are these uh, backbones. So here's the, the interesting fact. There are 100,000 different proteins, and all proteins are the same in this regard. All proteins are like beaded strings. The beads are amino acids. So when you go to the health food store and you hear about amino acids, what are they? They're the building blocks of the beads. There are 20 different kinds of amino acids that make up the beads. So what is different between 100,000 different proteins? And the answer is this, the length of the chain and the sequence of the beads. The sequence of the beads give the shape. Well, you say, well, where can you get some shape out of this? Looks like spaghetti. There's no shape in this. And the answer is, well, the beads actually have a little bit more rigid structure. So what I'm going to use are these pipe fittings that are going to represent three different kinds of amino acids just by the colors. So instead of 20, I'm only going to show you three. And what they look like are actually, if you look at the backbone there, they actually look like these pipe fittings. And the reality is this. The amino acids plug in together like that. And when they plug in together, you can start to assemble them. And actually, it's still a chain, isn't it? If you think about it, it's just a sequence. But now, instead of being flexible, now you begin to see that there's a very specific shape that's occurring here when I start to assemble them. So as I start to assemble my protein, all of a sudden, you see the backbone starts to acquire a three-dimensional shape. So do you see the three-dimensional shape? Say, yeah. yeah. I thought you'd see it. And the reality is this. 
if you see it, compare it to the, to the shape back there. You see the, the similarity and the colors? And the fact is this, that the protein backbone are these amino acids. And if I change the sequence that I put this together with, I won't get the same structure. So the point is this, each protein is different because each protein has a pattern that is determined by the sequence of the subunits that are making them all come together so that a protein has that particular structure to it. It's just like a backbone like in you. Your shape is determined by your backbone. And so the fact is this, where you have vertebral bones, the protein has these amino acid subunits. And the reality is this, but you also can change your shape as you bend and twist your backbone, then the truth is proteins do the same thing. Proteins are like miniature people in that regard. So instead of looking at a machine like this, the metal machine that we're used to, imagine if I replace the gears with proteins. Okay, now we have a protein watch. But the bottom line is this, let's get rid of all the metal. And now you're saying, what? Well, th what is this, a collection of protein? It's not a collection of protein, it's an interaction. It's like gears, that these protein machines actually start to work together to do what? Digestion, respiration, muscle contraction, all these are machine-like elements. In fact, I could take the proteins out of your body, put them in a test tube, and carry out the same functions. I can do digestion in a test tube. I can do muscle contraction in a test tube. The point is this, your body cells are made out of these inter interesting protein parts. And now let me just talk about the fact is that, remember I showed you there's a backbone version like on the left side of the screen, and then there's a fleshed out version on the right side, it's the same protein. The yellow is an antigen, like a virus. The blue is a protein called an antibody. What I want you to notice is, you see how the shape of the protein and the antigen are complementary? What happens if I would come up here and take out that yellow antigen? What would be left on the surface of the protein? A pocket, a cleft. What would fit back into that shape? The same thing that I pulled out of it. In other words, the shape is so specific that protein surfaces have pockets and clefts and other things plug into them. And I'll give you one more example of that. Here's an enzyme in blue and then there's a chemical group that plugs in right in there. And look at the shape of the pocket and the chemical group. Why am I bringing this up? And the answer is this. Proteins bind to things in the environment. And they bind with a very high specificity because of the shape. And let me give you an example of this. And let me show you, actually, this is the interesting part. Let me show you where life comes from. You can see it right in this little model. It's going to work like this. First thing before I do this, I'm going to say this. The two amino acids in yellow, let's say they're negatively charged. Okay? You know what like charges repel each other and opposite charges attract? Are you familiar with that? So the question is this. I'm going to show you two shapes. And then you tell me which is stable. Shape one is this one. See the shape? Okay, shape two is this one. Which is more stable, one or two? Two, because the opposite, the, these like charges want to get far away as they can from each other. So I say, I showed you that the protein has two shapes, but right now I'm going to say that this is the preferred shape of the protein. Why? Because the two uh, like charges are as far apart as they can. Now a drug, a chemical, or a hormone comes into the environment, just like that antigen in the antibody, and it plugs in. And I'm going to call this a signal now. Now let's say the signal, because the signal is going to be positive, and this is negative, what's going to happen when this comes by? It's going to attract it. Now it binds it, right? Now the question is this. What charge is at the end of this chain, positive or negative? What charge is at the end of this one? Now the question is this. Is this more stable or is this one more stable? Okay, so what did you just... Now just think of the logic, what you just said. You showed me two different shapes for the same protein, right? And what's the difference? Of, why does it have two shapes? Because if I take away the charge, let's say I take away this drug, what's, what's, going to, what's the protein going to do? It's going to go back to this one, right? This is movement, right? Did it go from one to two? Did it move? Movement is the source of life. It's just the only molecules that move. Proteins move. Life comes from moving proteins. When I make the protein as it moves do work, then behavior comes from the movement of protein. So basically the question is this, where does life come from? And the answer is, First from the structure, the proteins provide for the structure of the body, but then the proteins are capable of changing their shape. Changing shape is called conformation changing. As illustrated right here on this picture, there's a protein, and this is right out of the science journal, so it's not my pipe fittings, this is the molecular model that's in the journal. And you can see the protein in green on the left, is, this is the protein that causes muscles to contract. It's a switch, it's like an on-off switch. In the green form, the muscles don't contract. But when I add a signal, which is that white dot, it's calcium, 
when the calcium plugs into the molecule, it's exactly the same as the signal plunging into my protein. It changes the electrical charge. And when the charge changes on the protein, it changes its shape. So I go from confirmation to one to confirmation two. But what if I take the signal away? Well, when I take the signal away, as you saw, the protein will reset back into the original confirmation. So the point is this. A protein exists, and it will not move until what happens? What is the event that causes the protein to move? The signal. So the signal, when it shows up, causes the protein to make work. So the fact is, the body coordinates the functions of the system by controlling the signals to the proteins, which then control their movement. And that movement is generated into functional things like breathing and digesting and moving and excreting waste matter. It's all through these functions of the protein. So the conclusion is simple. Proteins change shape, that results in movement, and the movement is harnessed by the cell to do work and behavior. So that proteins give you your, not only your physical structure, proteins also provide for your function. So when you look in the mirror and you look at your identity and your character, you're really looking at the proteins that are giving you the shape. But you also recognize this, that you can change your shape and you can change your movement because proteins also move and change their shape so that the bottom line of life comes from protein movement. That's the truth. If you stop protein movement, life stops right at that point. And it's, proteins are the only molecules that are moving, so they become the most important ones in the generation of life. So if I have a test tube on the left side, I put all the proteins of the cell, and I have a cell on the right side with all the proteins in it, so the, the proteins are exactly the same in the left and right, the test tube is not alive, but the cell is alive. And yet it has the same protein. So the question now is, what, what is the difference between the two? And the answer is simply this. The cell has control. The test tube, all the proteins are just working randomly. There's no order, no organization, no orientation. They're just making a gamish. And they're all moving around, but they don't lead to a direction of life. To have life, I have to control the protein's functions. Then I have, I have control. And the question is, so what controls life? Now here's an assumption, and this is where it all went wrong. It goes like this. Protein parts are like parts in a car. When you drive your car, after a while, the parts wear out. Let's say you're driving along, and, you're, and you're, your tire wears out, and it goes flat. What happens to your driving then? It stops. OK, if you wanted to start again, what must you do first? Replace the tire. OK, here's the point. Proteins wear out. In fact, every day you're, you're losing cells and proteins by trillions of cells and tons of proteins are getting lost because you're using them. So we have to replace the proteins. So the scientists sat back and they said, what's the simplest way to control biology? And the answer is this. If I have a function and the proteins are making the function and a protein in that function wears out, what happens to the function? Okay, if I want to have that function again, what must I do? Replace the protein. So the scientists sat back and said, well, that's the simplest and easiest way to control biology. If we can find what replaces the protein, then we will find what controls the cell. So the bottom line is they started off already with an idea that was first grounded in the science in 1859 by Charles Darwin because he said this. He said that the traits and characters and behavior of an individual are due to hereditary factors. We didn't know back in 1859 what those hereditary factors are. But by 1953, this is what we found. They were looking for the hereditary factor because they said the hereditary factor controls the protein. So the belief is this, that the pattern of the protein, the beads, you know, the colors of the beads that I'm showing you here, are built into the patterns of the subunits on the DNA helix, those little things, the rungs of the ladder. And that these DNA codes for this. And the relevance of why DNA would be the hereditary material is because DNA doesn't wear out. DNA doesn't break down. In fact, you can find fossils, like 50,000-year-old fossils, and take DNA out of the fossils and put them in a test tube and make proteins using the DNA as a blueprint, make proteins from an animal that died 50,000 years ago. The point is, the DNA is stable. There are no proteins left from that animal, but the DNA is left behind. So the point is, DNA becomes a hereditary material because DNA has the ability to be stable and not, not wear itself out, and that's what allows it to be the hereditary material. So the conclusion of science, and this is a conventional view as we're speaking right here. This is what's being taught in schools, and everyone hears the story. It's called the primacy of DNA. And what does it mean? 
It says, I told you, you are protein. You're protein. Where does your protein come from? Ah, well, it comes from the DNA because that's the blueprint. And the DNA makes a Xerox copy of itself, which is called RNA, and the Xerox copy goes into the cell, and the blueprint, the RNA blueprint, is read and converted into the protein. So the bottom line is this. Here's a simple understanding. If your character is in your protein, where'd your protein come from? It came from the DNA. So therefore, your character is apparently determined by the DNA. So our belief in the primacy of DNA says this. Who you are, what you are, is predetermined in the blueprint, the DNA. So you become a readout of the DNA. So when you read articles like this in Life magazine that says, were you born this way? Now we start to recognize not only is our physical structure apparently determined by our DNA, but so is our behavior, aggression, anxiety, happiness, alcoholism, obesity. All these kinds of things are now attributed to what? Some pattern that you have received. So if you start to feel ill at some point, and then they start to say, well, God, that, you, know, you have genes that are affecting you in this. And so the point about it is ultimately what is the belief system? The belief system is if I can understand all the genes and then I could replace any broken genes that you have and I could replace your health. It's a nice, noble concept and led to the Human Genome Project. But the conclusion of this is what? This paper just occurred, this was only uh, back in uh, May, in Science, it's a mainstream journal, and it's about the nucleus, the cell, and the nucleus is a, an organelle inside the cell where the DNA is. And I bring this up because it, it, it says exactly what the conventional point of view is. It says the nucleus is the command center of the cell. What does it mean, command center of the cell? Well, what we were looking for was the brain of the cell. As I said, every cell has all the same functions that you have. You have organs to carry out your functions. Inside a cell, there are miniature organs, and they're called organelles. And I said, since you have all of your functions are in a cell, then a cell has a nervous system. The nervous system is the command center. The nervous system is now going to be the nucleus of the cell, that dark red structure. For what reason? Because conventional biology said that the nucleus is the command center of the cell. So what does that mean? Well, that's where all the genes are. All the genes are in the nucleus, and since the genes control who you are, then the nucleus, as a repository of all the genes, would represent the source of control. And therefore, it leads us to the conclusion that the equivalent of the brain is the nucleus. Does that so far make any sense of what I'm talking about? Okay, now listen to this. This is where it all falls apart. Listen to the simple logic question. If I take the brain out of any living organism, there's an immediate and necessary consequence of that action. What is it? Death. And here's the point. You can take the nucleus out of the cell, and the cell doesn't die. The cell can live for two or more months without any genes in it at all. It's not sitting there. It's moving around. It's eating. It's growing. It's meeting other cells and communicating with them. It recognizes toxins and avoids toxins. In other words, I did not change the behavior in one way, not so ever, by taking out all the genes. What does that mean? Think of the logic of what, what does the logic mean? Can the genes control, can be the brain of the cell, yes or no? Yeah, ah, well that's the important part because this is understanding of enucleation, the process of removing the nucleus. It's, it's done a lot at higher levels of biology and those people who do it obviously know the genes aren't controlling the cell, but somewhere along the line, all of you have heard through all the news media, of course the genes control the cell. So the bottom line is, assumption number two, genes control biological expression is false. But then that leaves us with the important question. If the genes aren't controlling the cell, what is controlling the cell? And this is where my research led me about in 1985 to understand the relationship that genes have with the cell. And the important part is this. In the literature, especially in mass media, these two words get confused all the time, correlation and causation. Correlation means associated with some, there's a connection between things. Genes are correlated with your body. That's a fact. Causation is the act or agency that produces an effect. Genes do not cause anything. That's the error. But the problem is this. You read an article, and this is a true story. An article that reveals, for example, that they found a gene correlated with obesity. And then, here's what was interesting about it. They went to a, a number of expected parents who were expecting a child, and they said, 
listen, if we would do amniocentesis and check the cells of your fetus and found that your fetus had this gene associated with obesity, what would you do? 70% of the parents said they would immediately opt for an abortion. And the relevance about that is, I never said the genes caused obesity, they're correlated with obesity. The fact is, if you read the articles, they always start out, a new gene is correlated with cancer. And then about a paragraph down the road, this gene causes cancer. This is an error. Genes do not cause anything. Genes are potential. Whether you activate the genes or not is not at the behest of the gene. So what is it that selects the genes? And the answer is, well, we start off with the, the, the first part about this is, what are the genes, what activates the genes? Because if I knew what activated the genes, then I'd be right at the at edge of what's controlling the genes. I use this paper because there's a, a sentence I use straight out of the paper, so I'm not trying to pull any wool over your eyes. This paper, Metaphors in the Role of Genes in Development, explains this. Metaphors means, in this case of science, when a scientist wants to do an experiment, he creates a hypothesis. This is an idea. The experiment is to test the idea. The hypothesis is not a truth, it's just a suggestion. In 1953, when Watson and Crick found the secret of the DNA code, the hypothesis was made that genes control biology. But that was in 1953. That was 50 years ago. And the issue is this. If you keep repeating that over and over again, at some point, you forget that it was a hypothesis. At some point, it becomes a truth. And so we buy the truth that it's in major textbooks everywhere. Genes control. Genes control. And the answer is, do genes control? This paper reveals in this sentence by Niehau the truth. When a gene product is needed, a signal from its environment, not an emergent property of the gene itself, activates expression of that gene. Well, the third line, not an emergent property of the gene itself, means this. Genes are blueprints. A blueprint is not on or off. A blueprint is just data. Can, if you had a blueprint to a house, does, is there an on and off to your blueprint? No. The blueprint doesn't go on and off, but what goes on and off is who's reading the blueprint. And the point is, genes are blueprints, but they don't determine if they're going to be read or not. And when it says, where, what makes it read? And the answer is a signal from its environment. Well, let me explain exactly how genes work. This is a picture of a nucleus of a cell that's isolated. That's where all the chromosomes are. Then there's a broken nucleus from the same preparation, and you can see all the chromosomes are lined up out there. And you can see, for example, the two red ones. And the point about it is this. You get two sets of chromosomes, one from your mother that comes with the egg, and one set of chromosomes from your father that comes with the sperm. So you actually have two complete sets of programs to make a human being in every cell in your body. And the issue about why I'm showing you this slide is because it's new interesting technique for staining the chromosomes. And the fact is, what am I staining? Well, the belief system is the nucleus contains the DNA, which it does. But here's the point. I'm not staining DNA. I'm staining protein. 50% of the nucleus is protein. But we don't talk about the protein. Why not? Because we're so focused on the DNA. When they do the experiments, what do they do? They break open the nucleus like this. They isolate the chromosomes. Then they throw away the proteins and study the pure DNA. But the truth is, there is no such thing as pure DNA in a human system. What does it look like in the system? And the answer looks like this. What are the proteins actually looking like? And, and right here, what you can see is this. The proteins are covering the outside of the DNA like a sleeve. These proteins are given a name of regulatory proteins, a great name because that's their function. How do they work? And it's so simple, it works like this. Imagine my arm as DNA. Well, let's imagine my bare arm as DNA. And I write a genetic code. Let's say I write the code for blue eyes on my arm, the genes that make the, the code for blue eyes. And I say, okay, what does this DNA look like when I put it back in the nucleus? And the answer is it looks like this. Can you read the genes or not? What do you have to do to read the genes? Say it. Take the sleeve off. Then you can read the gene because the code is written on the arm. So what's the sleeve? The sleeve is the protein. Well, how does a protein come on and off? And the answer is this. Here's a protein that is covering my DNA. And I change the signal by removing a signal or adding a signal. And what does a protein do? Change its shape. And when it changes its shape, it pulls away from the DNA. And the moment it pulls away from the DNA, I have bare DNA. Now I can read it. So the question is this. In order to read the genes of the cell, 
then what I have to do is affect the protein. So let's look at the flow chart now. Here's the current version of the flow chart. Remember before it was DNA, RNA, and protein, the conventional one that's in all the textbooks? And the answer is, well, that's incorrect. It's totally incorrect. For the answer is, the DNA is covered by regulatory proteins. And to, to get the regulatory proteins off, the sleeve off so I can read the gene, I need an environmental signal. So the bottom line is this. You're not controlled by DNA. You're controlled by environmental signals. And this is what Niehaut writes in his paper. Just reading the yellow lines is the answer. You are not controlled by genes before it's a signal from its environment that activates the expression of the gene. So all of a sudden it says, wait a minute, then I'm not, I'm not genetically determined? No, you're environmentally determined. And all of a sudden, so what's, you know, we have to talk about how does that happen? Let me explain the mechanism. First of all, what is the environment? Well, the environment, there are two environments that affect all of us. There's an internal environment under your skin, the environment of your physiology, your blood composition, the temperature of your body, the amount of sugar in your body, the amount of nutrients available, the information. This is the environment on the inside. Yet, what is the other environment? The environment on the outside controls us. Why? Because when we live in that environment, we have to adjust ourselves to what's ever happening. And to adjust ourselves, then we change our genes to adjust to the environmental signals because the environmental signals elicit the gene action. So the question is, so where's the brain of the cell? And the answer is, the brain of the cell is the membrane. It is the skin of the cell. What about our belief that the, the brain of the cell was the nucleus? And the answer is this. Science is a male-dominated profession. And since males think with this, they made the brain of the cell. But the bottom line, I'll tell you what the nucleus is. The nucleus is the gonad of the cell. Why? What is the function of the nucleus? To make the programs and blueprints to replace the parts. So when I need new parts, I go to the gonad to give me reproduction. So the nucleus is for reproduction, it's not for brain. The brain of the cell is the membrane, and I don't have a lot of time to go into exactly why, but you have to understand that the membrane is the most primitive structure in biology. The most primitive organisms have just a single membrane. They don't have anything else than that, and all their functions come from the membrane. So if we understand the membrane, we can then understand how it works. So let me illustrate, for example, how it works. Here are cells on the surface of a culture dish, and if I look at the membrane and I cut into the surface of the cell, this is what we see. That the surface of the cell looks like this layered structure right here that separates the outside environment from the inside environment. The yellow in the middle is like oil, and as a result, the membrane is a barrier that separates the outside from the inside because water can't go through the middle of the membrane and carry information across. So the self on the inside, under the membrane, is separated from the environment on the outside. But this wouldn't do any functions. This is just protection. To do function, I need the protein that does movement. Proteins do the movement. Proteins do the function. So like I showed you in my poppet bead version of the proteins, that these poppet beads insert themselves into that membrane structure that I showed you. And so the proteins stick inside the membrane. There are two classes of proteins in the membrane. They're very important. One set is called receptors. What's a receptor? Do you have receptors? Of course you do. What Name some. Skin, what, name some other ones that people are pretty obvious about. Eyes, ears, nose, taste, touch. Where are all the receptors located? In your skin. And the same with the cell. But in the cell, they're not organized into these structures that we see, but the proteins have antennas on them. And each different thing the cell can see has a different protein with a different antenna. So for insulin, I have a receptor that sees insulin. For glucose, I have a receptor that sees glucose. For light, I have a receptor that responds to photons of light. So for everything the cell can see, there's a special receptor inside the cell. And then the receptor is for what? Taking signals in. That's what receptors do. I see through my receptors. But now when the signals come in, I have to make a behavior to respond to the signal. So that's the other set of proteins. The example that I'm going to use from the other set is called a channel. A channel means a canal. And the point about it is, in the resting state, the channel is closed. Nothing can go through the channel. But in an activated state, the channel opens up and there's a tunnel that goes from one side of the membrane to the other. Let me explain how they work. This is an example of the, uh, of the receptor. Let's explain how it works. The receptor sits in the membrane, has an antenna sticking up, and look at the bottom. Watch what happens when a signal comes in. 
The signal, remember, the environmental signals cause a confirmation change. So look at the shape. So if I'm inside the cell, I know if the signal is there because I can look at it. But when the signal goes away, then the confirmation goes back. So remember, I showed you this. Confirmation one, confirmation two. What was the difference between one and two? The signal. So when a signal comes in, the antenna receptor changes its structure. Now the other proteins, the channel looks like this. When we <clears throat> look at the channels inside the membrane, they too float around inside the membrane, but a channel is different because a channel is closed. And uh, we said the channel works when it opens up. So when a signal comes in, it opens up, and then information or molecules can shoot down the tunnel, down into the cell. And they can only do it when it opens and closes. But look, the wrong size signals don't go in, so the channels regulate which things can get in by opening and closing. So what we looked at is this. We saw signals come into antennas and change the structure of the receptor. And we saw that the output device, in this case a channel, can open or close when the signal comes in. Now let's put them together and see what, they, what happens when they come together. And the answer is this. The antenna on the left is going to scan the environment. Notice the shape of the protein inside the cell. It's a smooth tube. This is a connector called the G protein. Look at its shape. Can it plug onto that? Yes or no? No, look at the shape, it won't fit. So that when no signal is there, that connector doesn't connect. But when the signal shows in, it changes the shape, connects this one to this one, changes this one, and this makes a signal. So I have an environmental signal coming in the antenna, and then the channel on the right converts that signal into behavior. Do you understand? It's a switch. So let's, just do, let's see if I can do this one again. If I can uh, show it to you again, um, it works like this. Again, watch this. This is what controls biology. Antennas receive the signal from the environment, and when a signal is received, it changes the shape of the protein and allows the connecting device to connect the receptor to the output. The output is the channel. The channel creates a signal that enters into the cell, and that signal that now is going to go enter into the cell activates the functions of the cell. It causes the cell to move. It causes the cell to digest things. It causes the cell to change its uh, structure or behavior. So the fact is what? This is a, a signaling device. This is the actual device that controls the behavior of the cell. So how does it work? Well, the receptor picks up a stimulus, right? Say, say yeah or no, so we go like, yeah. Okay, yeah. And, and then the output goes through the channel because the channel is closed and when the signal comes, the channel opens and then the signal goes down and activates the functions of the cell. So the stimulus is received by the receptor and the response is produced by the channel or the effector. So when I put that together, what does it mean? It says this. It says stimulus response, that biology is stimulus response, that the inputs, the signals from the environment, are collected by the receptors, and the receptors read the environment, whether they're reading the external environment or the internal environment. But once they receive a signal, I get a response. That's the output. Behavior is a response. So the output is mediated by effectors, such as the channel. So the bottom line is this. Environmental signals elicit behavior. Got it? <laughs> if, I get a, if I remove the environmental signals, what behavior do I have? None. And this is an interesting point. As I said, I could take the nucleus out of the cell. I don't change the behavior at all. But if I go to the cell and cut off the antennas, the cell has no behavior. Now just think for a second. Stop and just think for the profound meaning of what this says. Then the behavior you're expressing is what? a reflection of the signals that come from the environment. So all of a sudden, your behavior is not coming from the inside as much as it's totally a reflection of what you see on the outside. And so that this is changing your life is through this. But this device is what controls the cell, that there are thousands and thousands of these input and output devices controlling the cell. Now, is it, is it clear at least that how this acts as a switch? Say yes or no so I know what we're doing okay. Well, if now you recognize that each one of these things can activate a function of the cell. Now, this is the beautiful part, because I'm going to let you say the words. Is it true or not that the receptor represents awareness of the environment? OK. Is it true or not that when the channels or whatever the output devices are start to create a physical response, that they create a physical sensation in the cell? OK, so is this what controls the cell, or at least a function within the cell, yes or no? What is this called? And the answer is, in the dictionary, there is a word for this. And the word is perception, awareness of the environment through physical sensation. And basically, so you just saw the labeling of what? 
a device that controls the cell. What is this device that controls the cell known as perception? So are you controlled by genes? No, you're controlled by perception. Perception is how you read the environment and adjust your behavior. It makes sense because if your behavior is linked to the environment, then you're in, in coordinated with the environment. If your behavior is not connected to, the, to what's going on in the environment, you're out of sync. And that actually is neurological problems in many cases when your behavior doesn't fit the environment. So the point about it is this, cells started to come together into community. And why this was relevant is each cell is reading what it should do by reading the environment. But when cells start to come together in a community to make a multicellular organism like you or myself, then something has to happen. What's different about the individual versus a community and it's this, if I'm just a free living cell, I can walk around and do anything I want and it doesn't make any difference. But if I join a community, then the word community has meaning. It means communication. It means holding it together. That my, as an individual cell in the community, I can't do what I want to do. I have to do what the community agrees. That's part of the deal. If I give up my independence, I give it up to join the community. But the reason for joining the community is my, I've got greater chance of survival with more members all working together. That's what community is all about. That's why, community, why people came together to form communities instead of living alone, because community brings greater life. But when I look at that, then here's the important understanding. If a cell doesn't listen to the community's voice, then the cell is not part of the community. Cancer cells have withdrawn from the community. They're still in there, but they're not listening to the voice of the community. They're doing their own thing. Why would some cells get out of the community? And the answer is, why, do people, why are people homeless? Why are people out of work or why are people separating? If the community is not supporting them at some point, the cells recognize, my God, what do I want to be in this for? So there's a point that cancer starts to recognize as a result of breakdown of community. Well, let's look at cells moving in community. This is a uh, movement of a bunch of cells, and I'm going to show you the communication using a special dye. I can show you how the cells are communicating in this community. There's a dye that you can see the nervous connection of cells. Now, in this one, the dye lights up. It's a fluorescent dye. Now, you see the sparkling and flashing? That's the neurological process of each individual cell. But watch what happens. Waves of information start. Why? Because the cells are connected to each other. So the actions of some cells are spreading to other cells. So what you're actually looking at, it's sort of like an uh, electroencephalograph of cells. You're watching cells talking to each other because cells work together in a community. When the community falls apart, that's when disease starts to happen because that means that they're not, for some whatever reason, they're not being supported and, that's, and that will then uh, lead to the end of the community. So the point about it is this. Each cell has a brain. That's a fact. Each cell can read the environment and adjust its function for whatever it sees. But when cells get in a community, they defer their own belief system or their own system of what they're seeing to the central command. So as you can see here, I have a cell here on the right-hand side, uh, marked in purple over here, that this cell is out here in the environment. But what should its function be? Well, the answer is it's going to be coordinated by the brain because the brain is going to tell all the cells what we should do to work together to you know, provide for the success of my living organism. So the brain gets in between the environment and the cell. The cell no longer reads its own environment. The cell depends on the central nervous system to tell us about the environment. So the bottom line is this. The cell on the right is intelligent. It will always be able to adjust itself to the environment. That's when I was taking cells out of sick people and putting them in culture. They started to get better because when left alone, they could say, man, I could live comfortably alone without being in that system anymore. <laughs> and then, so the fact is, so what regulates a cell now? When it's in a community, the cell reads the environment, which is the left side, uh, but it doesn't read it directly. It now reads the environment through the brain, and the brain interprets the environment and then tells the cell what adjustment it should do to live in the environment that is seen. And the issue is, in general cases, this wouldn't be any big deal. But the issue deals with what about our perceptions? Because perception is controlling the cell, not the genes. Well, let's ask some simple questions about perceptions. So you can take a test here, because it's a perception test. And the perception test works like this. Very simple question. Is A, the surface area of A, greater than, equal to, or less than the surface area of B? What's your answer? Less. Cool. But that's so easy. Everybody can figure this guy out because they're nice little square boxes. But what if they're not so square? What if they're irregular shapes? So let's take a look at it this way. 
Okay, th you take this test. I'm going to ask four questions, and then I'm going to go over the answers. And the questions are basically the same in each one. Is the one country greater than, equal to, or less than the other? E equal to means approximate, okay? So the point is this. From your perception, and they get easier because I don't want you know, everybody to get all the answers wrong because you'll go home disgruntled. So I make them easier as we go along. The first one, is South America greater than, equal to, or less than Europe in surface area? Okay, hold that. Another tough one, not as tough, but is Scandinavia greater than, equal to, or less than India? Make a decision on that. And if you have trouble with that, let's make an easier one. Alaska and Mexico. And if you really got trouble and you got real vision error, is the north greater than or equal to or less than the south? You got those down? OK, so now let's look at the answers. The answer is South America is twice as large as Europe. You got that right? You got it right, good. OK, um, let's talk about Scandinavia and India. India is three times larger than Scandinavia. Did you get that one right? Oh, OK, maybe the easier ones. Let's go to the easier ones. Um, Mexico and Alaska, they're about the same size. OK, and uh, lastly, the north and the south. The south is twice as large as the north. OK, everybody got 100. Well, what's the point about this? And the point about it is what? This is your perception. What's it based on? The map. And so the reality is this. Let's look at the map. The map was made by Germans. So where do you think the dead center of the map is? <laughs> and what's the equator represent? What's the equator represent? It's the midpoint between the north and the south. But on the maps that we have studied ever since we were kids, where's the equator? It's two-thirds down the bottom of the map. So if I adjust the equator and bring it back into the proper order, then this is the map that you will see because this is the map that was put out by the United Nations. And the relevance of this map is what? It's not the world as you thought it was, right? And it basically, remember that third world, that little place someplace else? The third world is twice as large as the first world. And our perceptions have been off. Our perceptions which make us act in response to our perception, if we would use this map, if your life was dependent upon getting 100 on this exam, there would be a lot of dead people in this room at some point. <laughs> so the point is what? The point is perception is what gets between the environment and the cells. But what do we know about perception now? What do we just know? We just heard it. Perceptions may not be right. So rather than calling perception of the environment beliefs, it's your belief about the environment that adjusts your physiology. And your beliefs become then most important because your beliefs are connected to your genes. And that the expression that you have is related to what you have going on in your head. Think about it. Maybe perhaps think about a time when you were really sick and you said, oh, God, I can't get up. And then somebody said, look, you've got to come to work right now. You've got to do something. You had to change your belief. What happened? You changed your belief, you got up, you got dressed, and you did the job just fine until you were able to go home and say, God, I think I can sit down and be sick now again. <laughs> and so the issue is this, that the point is the truth. Perception selects genes, but perceptions may not always be right. And therefore, perceptions, by definition, are called beliefs. And therefore, when I put that back into the equation, you're not controlled by genes, you're controlled by belief. And why that also comes to an important point is this. These women dance because their passion in life is to dance. They have no other belief except for the fact that they know they're going to dance. Age is not relevant to these women. Aging is a belief. And the problem with this belief about aging is that it will kill you. The belief of aging will kill you for this reason. As soon as you start to tell yourself in your perception that you can't do something anymore, then your biological system will adjust to prove you right. You will not do what you think you can't do. And the issue that you know has to do with use and disuse. And aging is one of the serious problems of disuse. When we tell people, OK, you're too old, stop doing this. People say, OK, I'm going to retire. I, my father works six and a half days a week. He retired, and he died within a year. Why? And most people, in some level, are involved with sickness and illness after they retire. Why? Because what are you telling your body? What's your belief? You are finished. You are finished. 
And the significance is this. When we start to pretend we're finished, we stop doing things. When we stop doing things, the body will start to resorb the structures. Things like osteoporosis. Why do so many people have osteoporosis at that age, that older age? Well, how many of those people, for the greatest exercise, turn the television on and off? <laughs> if you sit down and you do not exercise, then the system will take itself apart. You don't have to be old for this to occur. I get to have a 10-year-old kid with a broken arm, and when I put a cast on that kid's arm, and I come back six weeks later and take the cast off and compare the muscles, there's going to be half the amount of muscle in the arm. And the bone density is going to be greatly reduced, showing osteoporosis, if that was what your assessment was. And the bottom line is the kid doesn't have osteoporosis. What's the function? He's not using it. And just recently, it has been repeated several times now, the primary cause or contributing factor of Alzheimer's, lack of use of the brain. That when people separate, and as they get older, stop communicating, this is one of the main contributors to dementia. The fact that when you stop using your brain and start turning it off because I'm finished, the brain, just like the muscles in the arm, will start to remove the cells because the intelligence of the system is so superb, it says efficiency is the basis of life. We don't, as humans, we, we don't know nothing about efficiency. I'll tell you that right now. Cells do. <laughs> cells know that if a structure is not being used, they will not support it. And the relevance about it is this. The vitality of these women is the vitality of their belief system, the fact that they know they're not finished and that, that keeps them alive and it keeps them young. And there are people out here in the audience that know there are some people out here that are working past their retirement age and they're healthier and happier for the process. So again, the end this first part, this is the understanding. You are machines made out of proteins. The proteins move in response to the signals. The signals are controlled by the membrane, which reads the signals and then adjusts the body by sending signals to the body to respond to the environment. That the environmental signals are perceptions by definition. You saw it. Awareness of the environment through physical sensation is perception. But then, as we also saw, perception may not be accurate. And when a perception is not accurate, then it's really a belief more than a perception. And the bottom line is this. The conclusion is that beliefs run the genes. And we know this in many cases, especially people that have terminal cancer. The only ones that can really get out of that pronouncement of death are the people who do what? change their entire belief system and say, I'm not buying that story. I'm out of here. I'm going out to live my life. And when they do, they take control of their life. And guess what? They start to manifest a remission and more health through the process. So the bottom line is, the truth is you are not genetically controlled, but you're controlled by your perceptions. Now, when I extend this in the next half, what I'm going to extend on and talk about is simply this. The signals that are in the environment are not just physical signals as materialistic Newtonian biologists believe. That energy is equally valuable in eliciting biological systems, and I'll demonstrate that, as well as, as molecules. I will also start to talk about the role of parents in conscious parenting because the belief of the parents is now recognized to select the genes in the fetus. That if you were a parent or you were once a baby, then that would be very important to you for the following reason. It reveals that we were, the life that we express today was very, very much shaped by the belief of our parents. And I'll talk about that. And then the most important part, how belief can rewrite your genes. And I will show you the science of that when we come back from the short break. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for staying. I know it's getting later, but we'll try and finish this. Because this is, as uh, Doug said, this is the relevant part because once we understand how the machine works, now let's talk about how the machine is programmed to work and this becomes more relevant for us. And I said there are several things I'm going to talk about, but the first one I want to talk about is what I call assumption number one. And that is the one that said biological processes employ Newtonian physics. And we talked about that and what we said is that Newtonian mechanisms are based on the universe being a matter machine so that all you have to study is the matter that it's a complex machine that if you take it apart and study the pieces, then you can understand how the complex machines by look, works by looking at all the individual pieces. And then by being able to do that, you should be able to create new pieces and control the expression of the machine. Remember, that was the mission statement of science, to control and dominate nature. 
Well, that means the ability to understand how the machine works and then replace the parts. Well, the issue about that is uh, revealed in this article, which was in Science. This is a mainstream journal, conventional uh, biomedical journal, and I'll read it for you in case you can't see it. And it says, but perhaps the biggest challenge to reductionism, reductionism, the concept of taking it apart and looking at it, it says, but perhaps the biggest challenge to reductionism comes from the concept of information. Remember, information are signals, okay? The signals are control. And here's what I'm going to emphasize it now. It says, in biology, information is carried and received by molecules, which is fully consistent with the reductionist principles of physics and chemistry. The point it says is this, that in biology, information is only in the molecules. If it's only in the molecules, then to adjust your body, I provide you with new molecules. And there, of course, is the foundation of the pharmaceutical industry to make new molecules to adjust your body. But the issue is, is information only carried in molecules? Well, in old-fashioned Newtonian physics, it is, but not in our new physics. The old Newtonian mechanism said the universe was made out of matter. It's just like a machine. But in 1925, we reestablished a new view of how the universe works. And it says this, that in quantum mechanics, the universe is actually made out of energy. What you look at as physical matter at the very atomic structure doesn't physically exist. That the atoms are not real physical and, at all. Even though I can show you an electron micrograph of atoms, they are pairs of atoms where the arrows are indicating right there. Here's an interesting truth. If I take a camera and start to get closer and closer and closer to that atom, that actually I could go all the way through the atom from one side to the other side and not see anything. The closer you get to the atom, the less you see. And the reason is this, that the atom is not physical. The atom is a vortex of energy. So inside the atom is nothing real structural. So we're familiar with the atom on the left, the Newtonian atom. All of us saw it, marbles, ball bearings going around like solar systems and all that. But here's the atom of today, the quantum atom. And it's not missing, it's actually there. But the issue is, a quantum atom has no physical structure to it. But the energy behaves as matter in an atom. But so the point about it is this. The world of medicine is based on Newtonian mechanics. It's based on materialism. But in quantum mechanics, it says matter isn't the end point. Energy is the end point. According to quantum physics, you can never understand the universe if you don't incorporate the role of energy in the process because energy shapes matter. Number two, the concept of reductionism. Sure, I can study atoms, how they connect to each other, and, and look at that as physical atoms, but the point is, atoms are not like marbles. Here's the edge of this marble, here's the edge of that marble. I can say this marble is separated from this marble, but the reality is this, they're energy. There are no edges to them. So this atom and this atom are always touching and entangled with each other. The atoms that are in your body are energy waves that are involved with the energy all around you as well. You cannot get out of the energy field. There is no way to study an individual without studying the energy. So the concept of reductionism gives way to this new understanding which biology is beginning to adjust to. It's called holism. It says everything is entangled. I can't just look at one little part and say that part is wrong because that part is connected to all the other parts. So the bottom line is this, we're pulling back, rather than looking at reductionism, we're pulling back and looking at holism. How your health is, is not just a matter of the physical structure in here, how your health is related, it's related to the environment and how you fit into the environment. So a doctor or a health practitioner, much concerned about how actions in your family dynamics, community dynamics, work dynamics, because all of those are contributing to the functional structure of your own body. So the fact is, looking at little things and blaming little points has been an error, because we now recognize that reductionism is not the way of seeing science, it's holism. And then, of course, the concept of determinism falls out completely, because you can't ever determine all the interacting events that lead to a, a process. And the result is actually there's a theory in, in quantum physics, not a theory, it's a principle called the uh, principle of uncertainty by Heisenberg. And it says the more accurate you try to measure something, other parameters of that disappear so that you can never actually determine anything. So we try to live best we can, but we can't ever really come to that belief of controlling in fullest how we live on this planet. I bring this paper up, Detecting atom, uh, Individual Atoms and Molecules with Lasers. 
Every atom or molecule emits and absorbs light of characteristic wavelengths. That's the first line under the title. What does it mean? Every atom and molecule emits energy. In other words, every atom is vibrating and giving off an energy frequency. But not only that, every atom is also receiving energy. So every atom or molecule in your body is not only giving off energy, but it's receiving energy, and the energy it receives will alter its expression. So what does that mean at the at level of the atom? Well, let me step in front of this and show you this. If I stand here, and, and if you can see my hand, and I, let's say that the red side of this nucleus, this is a theoretical model of an atom. We're still using the physical structure right now. Let's say the red side of the nucleus is negative, and the green side is positive. If I put a voltmeter over at this side of the atom, what, what am I going to read, positive or negative? Okay, the red, did I say the red side was positive? What did I say? Red is positive. So what side am I going to, what am I going to read over here? Positive. And if I read it on the other side, what is it going to be? Negative. If I read it at the middle, between both of them, what's the, think about it for a second, what's the answer? Neutral, because it's between both. Well, the fact is, yes, if I move the voltmeter all the way around, I'll get different voltages. But here's the truth. The atoms actually move themselves so that I don't have to move them around. The atoms are spinning. Oops, let me go back. I'll go back to that one again. Uh, the atoms are spinning, and as they spin, if I put a voltmeter out of here, then what's it going to do? Positive and negative. Color is positive and negative. So what am I reading? Positive and negative, positive and negative, positive and negative. If I attach a voltmeter, it looks like that. If I now get a printout, of the voltmeter, what does it look like? Then you see this, this wave, that there's positive and negative and they vibrate at different frequencies. Each atom has a unique characteristic vibrational frequency. And it broadcasts this because the energy is not held at the edge like here, but the energy travels throughout the environment. So when we read an atom, in the old days in our chemistry books, remember we had atomic mass and atomic structure and you know the density of atoms. Now, in the new quantum physics books, when you read about an atom, you read about its electrical charges, its volts. Atoms are measured by volts. And so what we're looking at is atoms have waves of frequency energy, so each atom vibrates at a frequency. So it's not only emitting a frequency, but atoms can also absorb frequency because energy can be absorbed by other energy. So when we look at this spectrum, this is what we saw in our chemistry books when we went to high school, an atomic spectrum here. So I have different molecules, hydrogen, helium, mercury, uranium, and little color bars, but colors are frequencies. They're, they're vibrational frequencies. What does it say? It says that each atom has a unique frequency vibrational signature that separates it from other atoms. That's how we can tell the composition of planets and stars because if we read the light emitted from them, the light can be interpreted as to, to the composition of the planet. So we can read frequency and understand matter through the frequency. Well, the relevant about this is in this picture right here. This is a breast scan. And the question is this. Am I actually looking at a picture of the breast, yes or no? Is this an actual photograph of a breast? No, it's an image of the breast. What is it an image of? It's an energy spectrum. And the new, it's interesting, medicine doesn't recognize the role of energy, but uses all the new quantum physics devices derived to read energy. So PET scans, CAT scans, EMI, you know, the MRIs, excuse me, all those kinds of technologies work on what? Reading the energy. So the relevance is this. They understand that the CAT scan will pick out the tissue there in the center where a cancer is. Well, why do I know that that's a cancer tissue? And the answer is, the energy emitted by those cells is different than all the other energy. So when I do an energy scan, I can start to see which the character of the cells by the energy they are emitting. Well, what's the relevance? And the answer is this. Conventional medicine would then see this and say, well, then what I have to do is go inside there physically, cut out that bad tissue and remove the bad tissue, only using the energy process for diagnostics. But the bottom line is this, as we showed in the slide about atoms. Not only do they emit energy, but they absorb energy. So the interesting part is, rather than physically going in there, it is then possible to put the energy back in to adjust the energy of the cells rather than to destroy the cells. And so the fact is, in the process of healing, healing energies, and we've heard about it for a long time, people emit energies, and that these energies influence the cells. And so the reality is that whether medicine wants to own it or not, physics 
automatically says you cannot deny the reality that physical matter radiates energy and absorbs energy, and by absorbing energy, I can change the structure of the matter. So the fact is, it's better in a longer understanding and a far better way off for all of us, rather than getting in our bodies and cutting it open and cutting pieces out, to understand by redirecting the energy back in the body, you can entrain cells that are not at the right energy to adapt and adopt the right energy and therefore do healing without cutting out the tissue itself. Well, how can that work? How can I send energy in and affect matter? Well, most of you have seen or heard about somebody like Ella Fitzgerald, uh, a vocalist who can sing a certain note and at, a cer at that certain time when that note is heard, a crystal goblet will explode. Uh, uh, people are familiar with the breaking glass with singing? How does it work? And it works like this. The crystal, the atoms, are all vibrating, just like I showed you. They're all spinning and they're vibrating, and they're vibrating at a certain frequency. So if I say that they're vibrating here at a fr frequency X, all the atoms, even though they're all in structure making the shape of the crystal goblet, they're connected to each other by uh, atomic bonds, but they're each individually vibrating where they are, like this. They're all hanging, but they still maintain the structure. Now I take a tuning fork, and it's tuned to the same frequency that the atoms are. And when I hit that tuning fork, the energy of the tuning fork radiates out. And if the atoms are complementary, harmonically resonant, that's the word, complementary, harmonically resonant with the tuning fork, then the atoms will absorb the energy, just like it said in that paper. All atoms emit and absorb energy. So if I tune the energy of the tuning fork to match the energy of the atoms, remember the atoms are just like this, but what happens if the tuning fork gives them extra energy and they absorb it? What happens to their movement? It goes faster and faster and boom! The point is, what happens is, the tuning fork causes the goblet not to break. In reality, if you see a photograph of it, the, tuning, the goblet doesn't break, the goblet explodes. Why? Because all the atoms are vibrating now with so much extra energy, they can't hold on to each other, and then the structure is completely gone. So this is a reality, that energy affects matter. And in fact, in medicine, they're actually using this in one process. Remember the you know, kidney stones that get in your, in your kidney, you have to pass them? That's the old way. What's the new way? Well, the kidney stones are crystals. And if they're crystals, the atoms vibrate at a certain frequency. So what the new procedure is, rather than passing the kidney stone, they put a probe up that broadcasts like a frequency, like a focused tuning fork, with the exact frequency of the kidney stone. And what happens to the kidney stone? The same thing that happens to the goblet. It explodes. And all of a sudden, you don't have to worry. Now all you've got to pass is a little sand, but not the whole rock along with it. So it's a lot easier in that process. But the question is, does this apply to biology? And the answer is, of course. And it works like this. Here's a tuning fork. There's a protein receptor with an antenna on it. The antenna vibrates at a certain frequency. Now, the antennas generally respond, as conventional medicine says, to molecules, which is true, because molecules have their own frequency, as it said in that slide. And when the molecule is present, if it vibrates at the same frequency as the receptor, then the receptor will vibrate when the molecule vibrates. And when the receptor vibrates, it will go from confirmation one to confirmation two as a result of responding to that vibrational energy. So the bottom line is what we expect is this. I hit the tuning fork, and then the, the receptor, which is in confirmation A, begins to absorb the energy, and then the result changes the shape of the protein, the structure, of, you know, the assembly of the, the, the backbone, how it's organized, changes that, and then the receptor goes to confirmation B or two at this particular case. So the point is this. The receptors which, remember what the function of the receptors are? They're the ones that signal the process. That the receptors not only respond to molecules, but the receptors respond to energy. Well, if they respond to energy, then why isn't it not, why is my medical doctor not talking about energy? Because I, as a medical professor, never taught them that in the first place. Why? Because when I was teaching medical doctors, that was not part of our understanding. And yet, I've, since my research started to take me that way, I realized something that there's been papers in the literature that have been in there for 50 or 100 years over and over again in the hard stream main core scientific journals, papers about what? Electromagnetic fields affecting every level of cell biology. The paper in the upper left, electromagnetic fields, the effect on DNA synthesis. There are certain electromagnetic fields that turn on DNA synthesis, other fields that shut it off. 
the one on the right, pulsing electromagnetic fields induce cellular transcription. That means RNA synthesis. So there are electromagnetic frequencies that turn on RNA synthesis and turn off RNA synthesis. The bottom one, exposure of salivary gland cells to low frequency electromagnetic fields alters polypeptide protein synthesis. What's the point? These are mainstream medical journals. What do they say? That the energy in the environment can activate all of the main functions of a cell, DNA synthesis, RNA synthesis, and protein synthesis. More than that, these papers also show, like the one in the upper left, that I can get blood vessels to differentiate, grow, and form blood vessels by putting them in electromagnetic fields, just putting the cells in the field. Or I can get mononuclear blood cells, the upper one on the right, to start to divide mitosis in the field. The electromagnetic fields can cause them to divide. Why is that relevant? When mononuclear cells start to divide out of control, that's called leukemia. So in other words, I can induce leukemia in an electromagnetic field by causing these cells to divide out of schedule. Uh, this one is very important here on the right. Noradrenaline release potentiated in a nerve cell line by low intensity pulse magnetic fields. And this is a new area that's getting a lot of attention. It's actually illustrated in the next slide as well. Electromagnetic fields, biological influences. Electromagnetic fields exert effects on and through hormones. What are the function of hormones? Regulation of the body. What does it now reveal? High tension lines, cell phones, microwaves, they all influence the hormones of the body and then throw the body out of alignment by being in the field. Now it says, well, how come literature says that, that the high tension lines don't affect people because that's what the story was? And the answer is that data was skewed and incorrect and they were required to do it again because there is an effect by electromagnetic fields on your biology. But here's the interesting little catch. If you are not under stress, the fields will not affect you. If you're under stress, you, the fields get very, very specific and can alter your biology. So the interesting thing, when they were doing the assays, nobody just detected the difference between stressed and non-stressed individuals. Now it reveals that stress is the primary mechanism that opens your body to the exposure and changing of its function by electromagnetic fields. And especially estrogen is one of the highest responding hormones in the body to electromagnetic fields. And that's relevant because estrogen is involved with cell proliferation and cancer. So that there's a, a connection between the fields now. Now, the signals that come in, let's just stop, let's end at this moment on that other section. What does it say? It says the signals control the biology that conventional medicine only, as it said in the science article, recognizes molecules as a source of the signals, but quantum physics, which is the parent science, and all science have to adopt to the quantum physics, so biology has to adopt the physics, and recognize what quantum physics says, is that energy activates these receptors as well, but I don't have to convince you of that, I already have all the literature in the papers right now, that energy does the same as molecules, so energy healing is not some kind of made up thing or some kind of, you know, uh, being uh, some quackery. Energy healing is real because energy is more effective in controlling biology than molecules are. And that's according to physics. So the bottom line is we have ignored the role of energy because conventional medicine is locked back in a pre-1925 version of physics. But in 1925, when quantum physics came in, it says you must include the energy in the equation. Now the question is this. I have a cell, and I know the behavior of the cell is elicited by the receptors that read the signals. Here's this beautiful understanding, because this is what simplifies my understanding about how it all works, and then it, I applied it to my life, and it made such beautiful uh, changes in my life. And it works like this. I used to clone human cells. And when I put them in the culture dishes, I'd observe their behavior and do things. And one of the things that's very interesting, if I put a cell in the culture dish when I started, and the cell is here, and I put food over here, when I start the experiment, I put the food over there and the cells over here. When I come back a little later, where do you think the cell is? The cell moves toward the food, right? Okay. Experiment number two. I put the cell over here at the start of the experiment, and I put toxin in over here. And I come back in a few minutes later, where's the cell going to be? Over here. Look, this is so beautiful because here's the truth. At the level of the cells of which we are based, there's only three behaviors a cell can do. Uh, uh, you know, 
obvious behaviors that you can see. And the, here are the three behaviors. The cell can move toward a signal, the cell can move away from a signal, and the third one is actually a signal can be made in the environment, but the cell ignores it because it's not relevant. So that's actually three different movements, moving forwards, moving backwards, or not moving at all. Does that, does that make sense? I mean, you can see it, right? So here's the issue. Then the behavior of the cell is actually divided into two kinds of behavior. When a signal is presented that the cell needs for its maintenance and its growth, the cell will always move toward the signal. When the cell is presented with a signal that threatens its life, then the cell will move away from the signal. So there's only two behaviors. What are they? Moving forward is growth, and moving backwards is protection. So the bottom line is this point. This, now look at the logic, because this is the part that's like profound but simple. A cell moves forward for growth, moves backwards for protection. Can a cell move forwards and backwards at the same time? Yes or no? No. no. Point. Fundamental profound nature of the point. The cells in your body are digital. When they receive signals that say growth, they will move toward things in growth. But if they're not receiving growth, then they will move backwards in protection. And the point about it is this, then the cells in your body are going back and forth between growth and protection based on what? The perception of the environment. But since the cells are in the community, they're also the perception of the brain. So as you're thinking, what are you doing to the cells? You're giving them information about their environment. If you think that, oh my God, I can't make it through this lecture because the damn projector broke. Oh my God, where do you think my cells are going? Oh, Bruce, oh, Bruce, you know, like they're hiding out. On the other hand, it's like, cool, we can make anything. We can do anything. We can survive. And what are the cells going to do? Well, they're not going to shirk backwards. They're going to move forwards in growth. Why is this relevant? Because the behavior is that clearly digitized that it's one or the other. And the point is this, although you have 100,000 different gene programs minimum, I can take all the gene programs in your body and divide them into two groups. Those genes that provide for growth and reproduction, and let me explain what I mean by growth. Growth is not just from a baby to an adult. You are growing every day, why? Because every day you're losing thousands, millions, trillions of cells a day. And if you don't replace those cells, what's going to happen to your body? You're going to de experience disease and death. And so the bottom line is this. Then for you to survive on a day-to-day -day basis just to keep level, you're growing all the time. And that's a requirement of the system. So the fact is this. Growth goes on and it keeps you healthy and alive. And then the issue is this. Once you reach a certain age, then the genes, there are also genes for, for growth, but growth of the next generation. So you, the growth genes are for you, or for the next generation. So those are growth genes, okay? On the other hand, growth, as I said, is only when the cells are moving forwards. But when cells are moving backwards, they exercise protection programs. So there's another set of genes in your body, or your cells, which are involved with your protection. But the point about it is this. A cell at any one time is either in growth or it's in protection, but it can't be in both. Now I gotta ask you a simple question, and it's economics. Does it take energy to grow? Does it take energy to protect yourself? Well, then the point about it becomes very simple because here's the point. When you find that you are in protection, you have to use energy. But the more protection you're in, the more energy you use. Well, where are you getting the energy from? You have a balance. You have like a checking account in your body of energy to run this body. And the more checks you write for protection, what happens to the balance? It gets less and less. And there's a point where so much protection is used that you actually now short growth processes. And this is true for like the nation right now. Right now, our budget has an excess of 50% of the US budget is in protection. What does that mean? Well, all that money is allocated for protection is not helping us grow or maintain the country in any way because that's all put in the armaments and whatever they are. And the issue is this applies to your own body. When you walk out on the street, when you wake up in the morning, you start to live, you're vacillating between growth and protection. And the issue about it is the more protection you require or you perceive you require, and that's, that's the trick, the one that says you think you need protection, the more you put into that, the less growth you start to accommodate. And here's an interesting part. You could be so afraid, you can be scared to death. And that's the truth. The truth is this. 
that fear can be so great that you absolutely shut off growth so quickly that you actually die right at that moment. And the reality is, understand the balance of your health is related to the amount of energy expenditure you're putting into protection. So the bottom line, survival is actually equal to growth divided by protection. And now look at this. Turn on the news, read the newspaper, listen to the, to the TV. What do you hear every day? More reasons to protect yourself. Well, the air's not good, the water's not good, the food's not good, these people are unsafe. These, every time you turn around, what are you doing? You're walling yourself off more and more. Why? Because growth means to go forwards. What is protection? Go backwards or wall off the outside. We start to isolate when we start to become fear-bound. And as we become fear-bound, we shut down growth as a natural biological mechanism. But it's interesting. I have 50 trillion cells. Each cell can be in growth or protection. But my whole body doesn't have to be in growth and protection, so I can have a range. My body can be in so many cells are in growth, so many in protection, so I can have a percent. So when I look at the human uh, system, I also recognize that growth and protection is a variable, okay? And here's the interesting part about it. When I'm growing, which biological systems in my body am I using for growth? And the answer is all the organs in here called the viscera the heart, the lungs, the digestive system, the liver and pancreas and all these things, these are for growth. When I protect myself, which system do I use? Get out of here, I'll hit you with my lung. No, that's probably not what it is, okay? The point is, when you're in protection, what physiological systems do you use for protection? Muscles and bones. And the interesting thing is, there's a switch in your body that switches from either the viscera or to the muscles and bones. Remember that, that, that thing we call fight or flight? Remember that adrenal system? The adrenal system is a master switch that switches between what? The, the two systems. The switch says, if I start to get into fight or flight, what am I going to use? Muscles and bones. Well, I shut down my viscera in the process. And that way, I have all my energy allocated to get ready to run. If I need to run away from a lion, I'm not going to start processing digestion at lunch. Why? Well, that energy might be the exact energy that it took me to get the last step so my foot doesn't get caught in a lion's mouth. So the system is intelligent. It says, when you're under threat, it will allocate the energy to where the threats are. It shuts off the, the visceral system. So the bottom line is simply this. In growth... The visceral system commands the somatic system. It works like this. In growth, I need water. So my, my body says I need water. Well, how do I get to the water? Oh, well, I move to the water. So how do I do that? Through my skeletal system. Well, who directs it? The viscera says I need water, so the skeletal system responds to the viscera's request. So the viscera administers to the need, I mean, the skeletal system administers to the viscera's need. But here's the interesting thing. My visitor says, Bruce, you need some water. So I say, okay, let's go get some water. So I start to go get some water, and right away, there's that lion right in front of me. And the fact is this, at the moment I see the lion, well, what do you think I'm going to do? Still go get the water? Nah. Really, at that point, my somatic system says, the hell with the water, we're running. So what's going to happen is I suppress the viscera when I activate the somatic system. And the point is, they're, they're bound to each other. It's called the autonomic nervous system, sympathetic, parasympathetic for the words. But the fact is what? One pushes the blood into the, to the skeletal system, and the other pushes the blood into the visceral system because the blood is nourishing it. So the bottom line is that humans are different in, than the individual cells because we have this graded effect. And here's the beautiful part about it. And you know this. Love is the maximum nourishment for growth. When you're in love, you will run to that place wherever it is. You have to go over the mountain or through the mountain. You will be attracted to it so much. Why? Because love provides a whole system, the, all the hormones and connections of the system to do what? Provide for your growth and your maintenance and your health. However, the moment you get in fear, then what do you have to do? You back away, you wall yourself off, you separate from the environment, and the consequence is this. Protection from the environment cuts you off from the environment. Cutting yourself off from the environment cuts you off from life. Now, the issue is very interestingly revealed, especially in uh, kids in Eastern Europe where they have the, so many orphanages. I always thought that these kids in Eastern Europe were in the orphanage because all the war is going on over there. It turns out that's not true. The kids are in the orphanages because the parents are still having babies because of whatever their religious beliefs are and they can't maintain them so orphanages are dumping sites 
for kids that parents can't maintain, not because they don't have parents. And it turns out, in the studies on these kids, virtually the largest percentage, over 80% of them, become autistic. What is an autistic child? A child that doesn't respond to the outside. Why? Because in, in the protection required to survive, the child walls itself off. And as a result, look at the pathology that results. These kids do not interact with our lives because they put a barrier between them and the outside world. But what else happens to them? Every growth parameter is reduced by from 30 to 40 percent or more. Their size, their height, their physiology. Why? Not getting love is losing the nourishment. Not getting the love means that if you're not getting love and support, then you're also then trying to protect yourself. In the absence of love is fear. And the result is fear will shut off your system. And I'll explain exactly how that happens in the human. There's a master switch. Every one of us is affected by it. The system in medicine is called the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. It affects every one of us. And it works like this. Stress is something that's perceived by the brain. Remember perception. <laughs> if I think of a signal as this is a scary signal, then it's stressful to me. Well, the issue is this. If I'm in growth, I go out and move forward toward it. But when I start to see stress, I have to protect myself. So the body gets, from the signal of the brain says, okay, mobilize the body for what? Growth or protection under stress? Protection. Well, how do you do that? And here's the answer. That the signal goes from the brain to the pituitary gland. Remember pituitary gland? Even you got that in high school. What is the, 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 the common name of the pituitary gland? The master gland. What does it mean? It's the gland whose function shapes the rest of this. So the brain says to the master gland, growth or protection. When the stress level is up, the master gland is given the, the signal to set up the body in the protection. So what happens is the uh, pituitary gland releases ACTH, which is a hormone that goes to the adrenal glands, which are on top of the kidneys. The adrenal glands secrete what? The adrenergic hormones, adrenaline. What's adrenaline for? Fight or flight. Now here's the interesting point. When the master gland says stress, what am I going to be in growth or protection? Okay, now here's what happens. The hormones of the adrenal gland squeeze or constrict the blood vessels in the viscera. And what they do is they force the blood from the viscera to go to the arms and the legs. Why would it do that? Think about why. Because you've got to run. So you've got to nourish the muscles. Well, the thing is, it preferentially puts blood into the, into the arms and legs. Well, the question is, if it preferentially put the blood into the arms and the legs, where was the blood before it was in the arms and legs? In the viscera. What's the function of the blood in the viscera? What functions? Growth. So when I get scared, what's the first thing that happens? I take the blood from here and push it out to here. Why? Because I've got to run and move and fight or flight or whatever it is I'm going to do. Well, the point is this. As soon as I got stressed, I shut down my growth mechanisms. The more stress you're under, the more chronically you suppress the growth mechanism. It's not, it's not a conscious decision. It's a part of the system called the HPA, the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. The significance of it is that the releasing of the glucocorticoids and adrenaline cause a fight or flight response. Well, here's an interesting point. Okay, do, did you get this right away? That under stress, the chemistry of the body causes the blood to go from the gut region into the arms. Does that make sense? Okay, and it makes sense then, if I don't have the blood in the gut, then the function of the gut is reduced. And that's what happens. But here's the other thing. Now think about this one, because this is like a, another adding an insult to an injury issue. And it goes like this. My immune system is a very expensive organ system to run. It costs a lot of body energy to run. It's a very high energy usage. If I am trying to protect myself from something that threatens me on the outside, do I use my immune system for that job, yes or no? What's the immune system function? Protection on the inside, so bacteria or viruses get in me, okay? So here's the point. I start to see the lion. I get the release of the adrenaline and the glucocorticoids. The blood is running into my arms and legs so I could run away from the lion. What do you think happens to my immune system? Do I increase its function or decrease its function? Decrease it, in fact, the same hormones, this is the point, the same hormones in stress are used by the medical profession to shut off the immune system in people who receive uh, transplants of organs and tissues. Why? Because I don't want to reject them. So how do I regulate the immune system? Well, I give them these hormones. But what hormones are these? These are the hormones from stress. 
So it says, okay, you're not receiving a, a, a graft of an organ or a tissue, but you're under stress. What happens to your immune system? It shuts down. And the reason why it does that is conservation of energy because I'm dealing with the external environment as the source of the threat. Well, you know this as well as I know this. When you get stressed, whether it's at school or at work, when the stress levels get real high, that's when you get sick. Why? Because when the stress levels got real high, that's when you also shut off your immune system. Important point about it is this. Then people say, well, I caught a cold. Or I caught something. The new, the, the, not new, it's actually, it, it's been a long-standing understanding in medicine already is this. Everyone in this audience is already infected with almost all the common pathogens in humans right now. They're in your blood. I can take a sample of your blood right now and I'll show you the bacteria and viruses that live in your blood. And you say, but Bruce, I'm not unhealthy. I'm pretty damn healthy. Look at me. So what are you talking about? I'm infected. And see what the name of the organisms are given as a group. They're called opportunistic organisms. What does it mean? It means that they live in your body, but they can't thrive. They can't thrive when you're in health. When you're in health, your physiology is like in a perfect balance. It doesn't support these organisms. But the moment you get stressed, you start to shut down the immune system, and you change the physiology of your body, then these organisms take the advantage. That's why they're called opportunities. That they were there all the time, but they can only express themselves when you're in a weakened state. When do you get in a weakened state? When you're under stress. So all of a sudden you start to get sick. You didn't necessarily catch it, you already got it. So the issue is this, what do you need to do to stay healthy? Regulate the stress. And what I will really emphasize over and over again, that remember I said approximately 5% of the people are affected or impaired lifestyle because of genetics. So their genetic defects, birth defects affect 5%. 95% of the people don't have defects in their genes and should live a normal life. When they start to get sick, then we can't go to the genes and start blaming the genes. We have to recognize that it was the environmental signals that we were adjusting ourselves to because when we're under stress, we automatically shut off growth. Now, you thought that was bad enough. You know, we shut down the viscera so we can run and so we're not getting growth. And we shut down the immune system because at that point, uh, it's not helping us with an external threat. Let me add the last kicker to it. And here's the kicker that's real important. Think about it. In a fight or flight situation, do you think you would use neurological reasoning and conscious, you know, like this, you know, that? Or do you use reflex behavior? Which one? Reflex behavior. You know what? Reflex behavior is the hind brain, and thinking and logic and reasoning are the forebrain. So here's what happens, and most of you have experienced it. It's called exam stress. And here's how it works. The moment the adrenaline levels and the glucocorticoid levels rise to get you into a fight or flight posture, remember I told you the blood vessels in the viscera are squeezed shut and forces the blood out to the periphery? The blood vessels in the forebrain get squeezed shut and only feed the blood to the hindbrain. When you're under stress, you lose intelligence. It's required because it's not a time to be thinking, it's a time to be responding. So the issue is, and if you've been in an exam stress, you know what that means. It's like you study like three days in a row. You got, oh, man, I really, I'm going to get an A. I sit down, open up the exam book, look at the first question. I don't know the first question. You know what happens? You could feel your body begin to change right there. Adrenaline's running all over. You start to sit in the seat. You're starting to shake. Your muscles are ready to run. Why? It'll protect your life now. And then you're trying to think of the answer. And guess what? You cannot think of the answer to that question. You probably cannot think of the answer to the next question or the next question until you do what? until you calm back down again. The reason is this, it's a protection mechanism that thinking is not helpful under a stressful situation. It will interfere with the response. So the bottom line is this, three things happen under stress, each one of them debilitating you at three different levels. Level one, your viscera shuts down, your growth and maintenance mechanisms are reduced. Number two, your immune system is shut down or inhibited to conserve energy, which then allows opportunistic organisms free run of the playground. Number three, in response to the stress, you start operating from reflex behavior, and your intelligence in the response is now lost from the response. And all of a sudden, you see the debilitating effects of stress. Now, it's not bad for an acute thing. I'm running, I fall down, I hurt myself. I can go through an acute little stress response. When does it have damage? I'll give you the simple, simple analogy to make sense of it. 
Imagine a community, let's go back to the 1950s. Remember those years when we were afraid the Russians were going to drop bombs on us, okay? So what did we do? We built bomb shelters. So the kids don't know about that, but we had bomb shelters. Now here's the issue. There's a community. Here we are in Memphis. Kids are going to school, factories are working, people are doing jobs. The community is in a state of growth, right? Yes or no? Say yeah. Good, good following on that. Good. Okay. They're in a state of growth. Now here's the issue. The air raid siren goes off. Where do the people go? To the bomb shelter. What happened to the job? It stops. The community function stops. The cells or the people are not into the, involved with the community. They're out to save their own individual lives. And the point is this, I go down in the bomb shelter and I wait and five minutes later the all clear goes, then what do we do? We go out of the bomb shelter, we go back to work, and it was just like, an, that's called an acute response. It's just a momentary event. So there was a short, you know, it's like a coffee break. We took an extra long coffee break, right? Here's where the problem comes. This is where the issue is. We're working on the job, the air raid siren goes off, we run into the bomb shelter, and we wait, and we wait, and we wait. And there's no all clear. What happens then? It's, it's automatic. What happens? Stress. And what happens to your survival? How long can you live in the bomb shelter? Or how much food did you store in there? And the bottom is this. What happens when you run out of food? Then what happens? You die. Here's the issue. Your cells are in a community. They work together in a coherent group just like the community of people. The moment the air raid siren goes off in, in the body saying our survival is under threat, then the cells get into the bomb shelter. The problem is most of our stresses are, are chronic. They're there all the time. And as long as we maintain a chronic stress, then the more stress we maintain, the more cells in my body stay in the bomb shelter and don't come back out. And the relevance is the cells will die, the tissues will undergo a disorganization, and disease will ensue. And the consequence, the stress. It wasn't the genes, it wasn't the system, it was the belief that went into it. So the bottom line is stress is the ultimate problem that we face if you got here with good genes. And I said 95 out of 100 got here with good genes. And stress does this. It alters the system. The stress signals come in at the cell membrane and activate the protein pathways, which are respiration, digestion, excretion, etc. But here's the issue. If a cell encounters stress, what can it do? I already mentioned a couple of things. Well, I'll tell you what it can do. Number one, it could wall itself off, go into the bomb shelter. And the question is, yeah, I can survive, but not for a long time doing that. So that's a, a temporary effect. It's the only thing I can do temporarily. Another thing cells can do is that they can secrete things in their environment to try to make their environment happier. But that's a very expensive process because if I can't change the whole environment, I'm always just wasting energy throwing it out. It's like trying to heat Memphis in the wintertime by opening your window and leaving your heater on, figuring maybe all of Memphis is going to get warm. And the bottom line is, no, that doesn't work either. So the third thing that is, that is possible, now this is real exciting stuff. The third thing that is possible is you can adapt. Well, what does that mean? Well, that means change your genes or change your biology to respond to the stress. Well, what is adaption in biology today? There is no adaption in biology. Why? Because we undergo a belief system called Darwinian evolution that says what? that the changes in the genes, the first premise is all gene changes are random. What does that mean? How can I adapt if my genes change randomly? I don't know, maybe sometimes they'll adapt, maybe they won't. And the problem is this, conventional biology has held for years and years and years the belief that when genes change, they only change by accident and randomly so that you can't ever control the outcome of a mutation. And so the consequence of that is Conventional belief then talks about, well, you know those 95 out of 100 people, that, let's say the, in cancer, in breast cancer, for example, again, 5% of women have a uh, hereditary linkage, 95% of women don't. Yet 95% of these other women who express the cancer alter the genes. So then what do we do? We go up to the chart and we say, well, the only way you can alter the genes is randomly, so it must have been just a random event. <laughs> cancer is random. Well, that's the belief system until we get rid of the assumption that Darwinian evolution is not the way that evolution really occurred. That there is another way. Well, what is that other way? It was first presented in 1988 in this paper that was published in the journal Nature. The Nature is a mainstream journal. And the journal is called, the article is called The Origin of Mutants by John Cairns, a British geneticist. 
And here's what he found. Listen to this because this is the, one of the most important papers in the history of biological science. Why? Here's what he did. He took bacteria that had a defective enzyme. The enzyme is called lactase. Lactase is an enzyme who breaks down the milk sugar called lactose. And that enzyme is necessary to break down the sugar to extract the energy in the building blocks so the bacteria can use the lactose as a food source to power its growth and division. So these bacteria that Karen starts with have defective enzymes for lactase. They cannot eat lactose. That's the truth. So he takes these bacteria and he puts them in a petri dish and the only food he put in the petri dish is lactose. Talk about stress. These little bacteria guys were going, oh man, there's nothing to eat in here. <laughs> well, the problem is this. When there's nothing to eat, they can't divide. And when they can't divide, they can't reproduce the DNA, which is generally where the source of the mutations occur. And the result is they can't divide, they can't change the DNA, we expect nothing to happen. And yet, in all the petri dishes, after a few days, there are bacterial colonies growing in every one of them. And the question was that Karen said, how the heck did that happen? <laughs> Conventional understanding says that these can't divide because there wasn't any energy, so they can't change the DNA. How did they change the DNA? So when he examined the DNA, what he found was they didn't randomly change a whole bunch of genes. They focused on the genes for lactose, the lactase enzyme, and they changed just the lactase gene, even though they weren't dividing. It was a whole new mechanism, a whole new concept. And the interesting part about it is when he reported this, the British journal Nature, they wrote an editorial right after his paper. The editors wrote, they said, look, John Cairns is a distinguished molecular geneticist. We know his work for years, but this paper we have trouble with. In fact, the title of the editorial that the British Journal had was, the title was, A Unicorn in the Garden. The point is a little British humor, you know, it's like a fantasy in the Garden of Eden here, you know. The Americans, no sense of humor, because a week later an editorial came out in the journal Science, which is the mainstream journal of American science, and look at the, her the, the title, A Heresy in Evolutionary Biology. What's a heresy? Well, that's for religious people. <laughs> And it said this, there's a religious belief, and the religious belief, and I say religious, is that it's underlined in there that mutations, uh, mutation is a continuous and random process. I'll read it for you because you may not be able to read it. The line underneath at the bottom, it says, Cairns demonstrate that bacteria can choose which mutations they should produce. Then the editors write, anything more heretical can hardly be imagined. Why are they so upset? And the answer is this. Think how profound it is. If mutations can occur as a result of adapting, then mutations are not necessarily random. And if mutations are not random, then evolution wasn't an accident. We didn't get here by accident. We got here by program. The relevance of this is that we actually got here through a process of creation and evolution simultaneously occurring that the organisms were pre-adapting to the environment and the signals in the environment were shaping the organism so that evolution was not an accident. Well, of course, conventional religious, you know, they, we went from religion, people wearing black coats, the new religion, they wear white lab coats, but it's just as much a religion as anything else. And the bottom line about that belief <laughs> is that when we question the belief, everybody, oh, what do you mean energy healing? Oh, that's heresy. What do you mean changing the genes? That's heresy. The truth is, no, it's called science. But science has a conviction to hold the truth, especially as the pharmaceutical industry, again, is trying to impress upon us because they're selling us a lot of things. So the bottom line is this. What does this say? Well, this paper, uh, let me explain. The paper that Cairns' paper came out in 1988. That was over 12 years ago, okay? This paper in Scientific American is in 1997, so that was nine years after. Point about this paper, I have to read it for you because you won't be able to read it. I'm gonna, and I'm going to use my theatrical, I'm on a stage, so I'm going to read it theatrically. It says, evolution evolving. I, here's my theatrical part. New findings suggest mutation is more complicated than anyone thought. First line, nine years ago... John Cairns. And the point was, new findings nine years ago? Where have these guys been? And the answer is this. 
For nine years, they consistently tried to undermine Cairns' findings. For nine years, they did that. When this paper was published in Scientific American, they're not saying that Cairns was right. What they're saying is this. They can't seem to find another explanation, but they're still looking for it. Because the idea is, it appears to be right, but it can't be right. So, but now it's a few more years down the road, and now we have another understanding. So now I'm going to show you this. And this is out of Science, the journal Science. So I'm, it's not a chart that I'm making up. This is a chart out of the journal Science. This is the flow chart of information before Cairns. This is the Darwinian flow chart. How does it work? It says organisms at the top mature and they mate. They create variants. So let's say two dogs. Two dogs at the top mate. They make a litter of puppies. The puppies are all variants of, of the parents. That what happens is, we also know there's a runt at one end of the litter and there's the bulldog one at the other end of the litter, so there's a range. When the puppies have to leave the litter and they have to go out and fend for their own lives, what's going to happen to the runt? Is it going to make it? No, it's not going to be able to survive. It won't be able to compete. So what happens is nature selects the strongest one to survive and gets rid of the weakest one. That's what selection is all about, natural selection. So it says this, that the, the, those that are capable of surviving mature start to cycle over again, that all the variations arise in the part of the reproduction phase, which is the belief is when the DNA gets altered. Now, I'm going to show you the new flow chart based on Cairns, and it becomes very relevant for this reason. Let me first explain it before I show it to you. You see the box variants? I'm going to show you in the new chart, it's on the right-hand side, but there are three variant boxes. So it goes organisms, variant, 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 selection, and I want to talk about those first. So let's take a look at the chart. The chart is this, organism, and there are three variants, genes of DNA metabolism, genotype variation, phenotype variation selection. Let me explain what they represent. Phenotype variation. Phenotype is the physical expression as you see it. So your phenotype is how you look physically in the world. Genotype is the underlying genetic code that programs for this structure. The box on the top, there's a new name for it. So let me give you the new name because it makes much more sense. The box on the top is not called genes of DNA metabolism anymore. There's a new name. It's called genetic engineering genes. What did they find? That in every nucleus, in every cell in your body, you have genes whose function it is to rewrite the other genes if they encounter stress. So the significance is then you're capable of rewriting your genes. But here's the most important part. What was not even included in the other chart but is now included and it wasn't there before? And the answer is these two boxes right here, the environment and organisms' perception of the environment. Look where the arrows go. What can the environment do? We'll follow the arrow. It goes up, across, number six and number five. What does it say it can do? The environment can cause the genetic engineering genes to rewrite your genes. Number two, they can change your genetic code. That's what it does. Now here's the important one. Organisms' perception of the environment. What can it do? It can rewrite your genes, number four, or it can change your physio physiological body to respond to the environment. What's the relevance of all this? Well, the environment was never even included in conventional biology. Now the environment is found to be very important, and more so, remember the slide I showed you about perceptions and belief? I overlay the top and look. Organism, environment, that's the slide we showed, is the environment. Organism's perception. We said perception is belief. And what does it affect? The cells. In what way? By rewriting the genes and changing the structure of the cells. The bottom line is this. Your belief in a stressful situation will rewrite your genes to accommodate the stress. And the relevance about that is that if the if a stressful environment is something that's not even real out there, you will change your biology to fit what you believe. And the issue is this, then specific organs and specific tissues of the body are connected to the beliefs. There's a great book by Louise Hay called You Can Heal Your Life. There's a glossary in the back and she's done great research to reveal that specific stresses affect different portions of your body. And as a result, if you understand which portion of your body is affecting the stress, then you can deal with it by understanding what emotions are eliciting that stress. And I'll give you, an, you know, it's just, it's just very critical to understand this, is that the, the symptoms of your body are your, your body telling you that you're under stress. That's clear. 
But the point about it is your body is trying to tell you with a symptom, deal with the stress. Because if you're not dealing with it, we're going to have a problem in here. And here's the interesting point. When we go to conventional medical care, what do they do with the symptom? They cover it up. And so you don't feel anything anymore. You know what the analogy is like? Because this is true. When I was working in graduate school, I was working in a, in a Chevy dealership uh, to make some money. And uh, Friday afternoon, all the guys had cleaned up their tools. The shop is ready. To, you know, everybody's closing up. It's almost 5 o'clock. Everybody wants to go home. And this woman came in, and she had been in a couple of times before. This is her third trip. For what's the issue? She came in because the little light on her dashboard says, Service Engine Now keeps going on. And she got very upset by this, and she's like, I brought in three times. She started to go through all the stuff, so one mechanic, brave guy, says, I can fix it. So he takes the car to the back to the bay. He gets inside the car. He goes under the dashboard. He pulls out the little light bulb. <laughs> and then he has a smoke and hangs out. Why? Because obviously it takes a long time to do this work so you can charge him, you know? And the bottom line is, after about 20, 30 minutes, he brings the car back out front and says, it's fixed. And the woman got in the car, and guess what? She was happier than anything could be. She drove away. The damn light didn't come on again. <laughs> the problem is this. When we go to rid ourselves of symptoms, we are pulling the light out. The symptom is just the information that something is going wrong, that if you cut off that information about the symptom, you're telling the body, I'm not listening to you. And what's the body going to do? going to find another way to bring you some more information, but the next time it's going to be worse news than it was the first time. And the issue is this, symptoms are telling you that you're not running in a coordinated fashion with your body, and that becomes important. So we want to now go this, and this is a very important section for me to get into. This is a, a section on conscious parenting, and it's based on this. This is the conventional law. This, remember I talked primacy of DNA a long time ago, first talk, right? I said that the flow of information goes from DNA to RNA to protein. And that means that all information is downloaded from the DNA. That's the conventional understanding. But we also now know that we now know information goes backwards. The first guy to find this was Howard Temin in 1960. He suggested that RNA could send information back into DNA, the reverse flow. And everybody said, oh, you're crazy. Again, he was a heretic. Why? Conventional religion said information only flowed this way. Well, he came up with it, and he said there's this thing he found called reverse transcriptase, an enzyme that takes RNA and codes it back into DNA backwards. Today, we all know this word because this is the AIDS virus. It really does exist. Even though they call him an idiot and a lunatic and all that, he got the Nobel Prize for it. John Cairns is the guy now who shows that information can go from protein back into RNA, and now we know RNA can go back into DNA, and since the protein is reading the environment, it says that the environment can change the DNA, and this is now becoming a known fact in science as well, so that the information is now going both ways. Why is this important? Because when, a normal, when we go to an OBGYN checkup, if you're, if you're pregnant, what is the doctor primarily interested in when he asks you, what questions are, are they looking for? Are you eating right? Do you have enough vitamins? Do you have enough minerals? It's like taking a dipstick and saying, you know, okay, you can grow a baby. You got all this stuff in there. And the bottom line is this. The belief is this. What is the role of the mother in conventional belief? Understand this. If the child is developing from the sperm and egg with the genes, and the conventional belief is that all the programming is in the genes, then the mother doesn't provide anything but nutrition. That is why, then, in an OBGYN checkup, they're really just asking about your nutritional health. But the bottom line is this. We know this is not right anymore. We know that the environment can change the genes. So the bottom line is this. The mother is now found to be providing information that the mother is adjusting the genes of the child. But it's not the mother alone. The mother is in cohorts with the father. So as the mother's perception of life is altered, it's usually in tandem with the husband. So it's not just the mother, it's the parents are affecting the offspring in this way. That, remember, what selects the, what selects the genes? We just, remember, we talked the genes can't select themselves. What selects the genes? First, first part of the lecture. Perception. The embryo is growing in uterus. What is it perceiving? What environment does the embryo perceive? The mother because it feeds off of the mother's blood. Cool. What does the mother's blood have in it? Of course it has nutrients in it. That's what provides the nutrition. What else does the mother's blood have in it? 
all the hormones and the molecules that organize her body to respond to the environment that she perceives. So guess what? The fetus is reading that. So the fetus is adjusting to the environment that the mother perceives. Why is that? Because nature is so intelligent. It said, sperm and egg are generic. When they come together, when was it and where was it? It makes a difference if the sperm and egg come together in, in, in the middle of Africa or the middle of, of Chicago. It's, they're two different environments. The two kids are not going to adjust the same in each environment, but the kid has to adjust before it's born. So it turns out that the mother is nature's head start program. It helps the child select the genes that will be necessary for that child to survive in the environment because the child's going to live in the environment that the mother perceives. So nature has taken the ability of the mother to have perception, cross that over the placenta, and the perception of the mother now becomes the perception of the child. And as this article in Newsweek uh, last year came out and said, where health begins, obesity, cancer, and heart attacks, how your odds are set in the womb. This new understanding comes out and says exactly what I'm trying to tell you, that the genes of the child are dynamically selected in response to the perception of the mother. And why that's important, as I said, is it allows the child to immediately be adapted to that environment that the mother lives in. However, since perceptions are beliefs, and since beliefs are not necessarily accurate, then a mother's perceptions, a mother and father, remember they're in tandem, the parents' perceptions are genetically selecting, you know, or, or genetic selection mechanisms for the child. Parents are genetic engineers. They're selecting genes. How is this child going to respond? Well, listen, think about it before I even show the slides. In a protection system, uh, well, I already screwed that question up. I was going to say, which system would you activate? The protection system. <laughs> and the answer is specifically this. In an environment that's threatening, perception system is activated, or protection is activated. In a supportive environment, growth is activated. Here's the truth before I show the slides because it's going to be really great. In an embryo, the organs and tissues that develop, develop in re relationship to the amount of blood they receive. The more blood they receive, the more better their development. Simple, obvious nourishment growth process. Well, look at this slide. In mice, mom's genes favor brains over brawn. I'm going to illustrate these two genetically identical mice in the next slide. But the relevance about it is this. As I said, these are genetically identical, but they're grown under two different environments. And the significance is this. They don't look the same anymore. They're not like clones of each other. What's different? Well, can you guess which one is the protection one and which is the growth, which was grown in, in a protection environment, which is grown in growth environment? Can you, can you guess? The one on the right is grown in a protection environment. Okay, why? Think about this. Let's go back. Remember HPA axis? When a stress response happens, where does the blood preferentially go? From the viscera to, to the arms and legs. Look at the body on this one. Look at the body on this one. So the point was, in a stressful environment, more blood went to the muscles of this individual. Why? Because this, this baby's getting ready to come out, fight or flight, man. It's getting ready to go. Okay, now the other thing is this. You can't see anything about the immune system, but Remember I talked about the brain? I said, what happens under stress in the brain? And the answer? The hindbrain gets more flow of blood and the forebrain gets squeezed. Look at the difference. You can see the forebrain as this dark structure above my hand right here. The forebrain in this one starts on the right and goes all the way back to the left. The difference in the brain, 50% of the brain is, is gone in mass. Why? Because the hindbrain is developed. Look at the big bulge sticking above my hand. That's the hindbrain. What's the function of this? This is an athlete. <laughs> what is this? This mouse is a mouth athlete. Why? It's got great muscles. It's got great reflexes. But it's a little short on the intelligence. And it turns out, a fact, 40 to 50% of a child's IQ potential is determined by the prenatal environment. This paper is illustrating that. It says in the uh, subtitle, the uh, genetic heritability of IQ remains highly contentious. A new analysis shows that genetic influences may be weaker and prenatal environmental influences greater than previously appreciated. It's based on a paper that reveals 40 to 50% of the potential IQ of a child as a variable based on the perception of the mother during pregnancy. And that says, 
Look at the way we raise kids today. Look at parents in inner city situations. Look at parents that are single parents that don't know whether they'll be able to provide for their child and for themselves. These parents live under high stress. When they live under high stress, the stress hormones cross the placenta and impact the child, selecting genes which alter the development and evolution of that child, as you saw in the Newsweek article, that it can select genes that lead to cancer, cardiovascular disease, obesity, are all been linked now to prenatal environmental influences. The role of the parent is highly important in the evolution of humans on this planet. It's called conscious parenting. Because when we're unconscious, we create athletes or fight street fighters. Street fighters is what ultimately be, they become. They live not off of brains, they live off of brawn. And we live in, in a world that we are experiencing lesser intelligence in the population year after year after year. The down dumbing of America. One of the main reasons, we haven't given attention to the reality that the child is being programmed genetically in utero in response to the mother's perception of the environment. This one is a very, very interesting and recent article in science, non-genomic transmission. That means transmission without genes. Non-genomic transmission across generations of maternal behavior and stress responses in the rat. And here's what it says. When a mother raises a child, that infant and from the neonate time is learning how to raise its own child that when, it, when that child grows up, it will raise the child the way it was raised. So the interesting part is when we raise a child, we're not just raising the next generation because we are also then influencing the subsequent generation because that, our child will raise their child the way we raise them. And the relevance about that is it's not genetic. And the interesting part is, then this means that we've also recognized as well, as the mother, oh, let me read the quote right off the bottom here. It says, they have shown that the environment can trigger differences in behavior and in stress-related gene expression that are passed on to the next generation. Meaning, how you live your life today will alter the genetics and behavior of your child tomorrow because you can pass this on immediately in one generation. And the significance of that is then all of a sudden the power of not recognizing that we've been doing this has to come into our lives so that we can start raising a generation that we can live with rather than a generation that may kill us in the end because of the, of the amount of aggression that we're building in and violence, which is a known part of this process right here, especially related to stress-related genes because in response to stress, violence is one of the primary ways of responding. So how does the brain work? That's this Jerry Van Amergen cartoon. So we're going to close out here in a couple of minutes. So hold on, we're just about finished. Let me explain something about the brain. It's a process of connections, connections of experiences. Experiences come into our, our perception. Perception is experience. That's what it is. And as we get a perception, we set up our body to respond to that perception. So basically it says this, the brain is the device that converts whatever the experiences are into awareness. So light comes into my eyes, but electromagnetic vibrations go out my nerve. Sound comes into my ear, but electromagnetic vibrations come out my nerve to my brain. Touch is physical pressure, but electromagnetic vibrations come up my arm. The point is the brain converts all of this environment into electromagnetic vibrations, which become our awareness. But the part about the brain is that it records these things so that as an experience comes in, not only are we seeing the picture at this moment and our live awareness, but we are also recording the ability to remember that experience. Why? And the answer, this is this, is this really critical but interesting part, is why? And the answer is this, because if I take my awareness and play it back through my brain, I repeat the experience again. The bottom line is the brain is a recorder. It's like a slide, it's like a camera that takes a slide. Here's a picture of what I learned and then awareness is the light bulb that illuminates the slide. So when I take my awareness and play it back through the slide, I recreate the behavior. So as much as people don't want to hear it and somebody says, well, you're just like your mom or you're just like your dad, and you go back and go, no, it can't be. And the reality is, yeah, because your behavior is how you learn from them and your behavior is a playback of your experiences. But then you say, wait, I have free will. I have a mind. I could think of different things. And the answer is this. This is where the critical part comes out is, is this based on this picture I'm going to show you, but it's based on this fact first. It is estimated that 4 billion nerve impulses are coming into your brain every second. While you're sitting right now, 
Four billion nerve impulses are hitting in your brain every second. But you can only handle approximately 2,000 bits of that data in consciousness. What does that mean? Well, it says that most of the information that's coming in is not being, you're not being consciously aware of it. I'll give you an example. Okay, you've been looking at the slides up here. All of a sudden, focus on the shirt on your back. Just focus on a sec. Can you feel it? Go, go ahead, move a little bit. Can you feel that sitting back there? And the point was, were you not feeling your shirt before I asked you to feel it? The answer is, no, you were feeling it all the time. Nerves don't shut off. They're always coming in. But the fact was what? Well, you weren't paying attention to it because it wasn't necessary for you and your consciousness to bring up the fact, hey, you're wearing a shirt, you're wearing a shirt, you're wearing a shirt, you're wearing a shirt. It's like, I know I'm wearing the shirt. You don't have to tell me. So the brain is smart. Things that it knows, it does not bring up to your conscious attention. Why? Because your conscious attention only can handle such a small percent. Let me show you what percent. Imagine there are four billion little tiny pixel dots that make up this landscape. And that this represents all the information coming into your brain right now. How much of this information in the slide actually enters into your consciousness? And the answer is, you see that little dot? If you can, or if you can't see it, that dot is a thousand times larger because I had to be able to show it to you. In other words, where's all this? What's all this stuff? And the stuff is, it's information that's coming into your head right now, but why isn't it in your consciousness? The answer is, because if you've already learned how to do something or respond to the signal, there's no reason that, like, hey, you got a shirt on, you got a shirt on. I don't need to know that. And the point about it is this. Then most of our behavior, listen to this, most of our behavior has been from experiential replaying over and over and over again. So the concept is this. Most of the behavior that you elicit, you don't think about consciously. I'll give you an example. For those that drive a car, it's a great example. Have you ever gotten in a car and gotten in a discussion with somebody while you were driving and you talked and you talked and you talked and you realized about a half hour later that you've been driving for a half an hour, you haven't paid attention to anything on the road, but you also realized you got here too, so you didn't hit anything either. And the point about it was what? Because driving is a learned experience that you can put it into your programming and do it automatically. Walking is a learned experience. I broke my knee a few years ago, and when I had it reconstructed, I realized I had to relearn how to walk because it took a whole process of how to move the leg and step and all that because when they rebuilt it, it broke up all the old pathways. And the point was, my God, when I walk down the street now, I don't think about moving this, yet it involves a lot of coordination, a lot of learning went into this. And the bottom point is this. Then most of the behavior that you elicit it's transparent to you. You don't even see it. Why? Because it's so automatic that on the job and whatever you're doing, it just comes out. Somebody pushes a button, you make a response. You're not thinking. You're, you're thinking about, well, I want to go on vacation. I can't wait to go home. I'm looking forward to this, and yet you're doing your job. How can you do that and still have those other thoughts go on in that little tiny dot of consciousness? And the answer is this, because almost all of our actions are out of our purview. We don't see them. They're repeated automatically. And why does this get to be a problem? It's the difference between walking your talk and not walking your talk. Why? In your head, you, you are a good person. You say to yourself, I'm a, you know, I'm, I try, I'm being good, I, I want to lose weight, I want all these things, why can't I control it? And the answer is, because all that consciousness represents is that little tiny dot. Most of the control, 99.999999% is already pre-programmed from your learned experiences. You can't lose weight just because that little conscious dot says so. You have to recognize you have weight because of whatever learning experiences you had about your life, they were programmed in there. You can get rid of the program, you could get amnesia. So I'll give you an example. Remember the movie regarding Henry with Harrison Ford? Here's a lawyer who gets shot and, and wakes up in the hospital and he's got amnesia. Who am I? What am I? Well, we know what's going on here. So they take him home, and his wife tries to say, this is how we live and all this, and he goes to the job, and all his work people are showing it, and he's a lawyer, you know, and he, start, he starts to look at, review from a distance, his life, because he wanted to fill the picture back in. And as he started to put the picture back in, he all of a sudden, he made up his mind, he said, you know, that really stinks, this is a stinking life. And he decided, the hell with the picture, I'm going to make a brand new life. So he got out there and ended up converting his beliefs into all new beliefs and immediately changed his life. And the problem is this, unless you have amnesia, all your beliefs are still locked in there. And the problem about that is, no matter if your consciousness says this is what you want to do, 
If you don't get to the core belief, you'll find that your thoughts and your actions are not on the same level with each other. And that people, you'll observe people and say, I don't know why people don't like me. I'm such a nice person. Get out of here and don't bother me. I'm talking over here. Can't you see it? I'm really a nice person. I don't get out. And the point, why? is because they don't even see themselves saying this. Why? It's all pre-programmed. But the consciousness is concerned about the fact that they're not liked. The issue is we have to connect our understanding to our beliefs. It's our beliefs that select our genes, the beliefs that we were programmed with. So the bottom line is that the cell is like a camera. And so how does a camera work? Well, there's an image outside that is projected through the lens, and the lens takes that image and focuses it on the film. What kind of image is made on the film? A complement. The film is always a complement to whatever it sees. It's a positive outside, it's a negative on the inside. So the, the material inside the camera is physically a complement of what it sees outside the camera. Well, the relevance of that is the cell is exactly the same mechanism. The cell perceives the environment, the lens is the membrane, which picks up the signals and then sends the signals into the nucleus. Then the nucleus will adjust the genes, as we saw in Cairns' work, to m adjust the genes to complement the environment. So if that arrow outside the cell is an antigen, a virus, or a bacterium, then the cell will make on the inside antibodies which are locking key complements of that. Well, that's beautiful. That says then that the, the structure of the cell is locked to what the cell perceives. The bottom line is this. Your cells, what is their physiology? And the answer is, what do you see? If you open your eyes, and this is the image that greets you when you open your eyes, then what kind of structure is your cell going to make in response to that? It will complement it. This is a pathological situation. The cells will become pathological. On the other hand, you could change your belief or open your eyes and see something much more beautiful like Maxfield Parrish's ecstasy. And then what the cells are going to do now? Are they going to be in growth or protection when they see this picture? Growth. Well, growth is going to allow the maintenance and survival and health of the individual. Okay? But now here's we also learn this, that filters can get between the camera and the reality. And when you put filters in, you change the image by modifying it by the filter. Understandable? So the bottom line is this. Cells have filters. And the filter is what? Belief. Belief gets between the environment and the response of the cell. So the belief is a filter that takes the environment and converts it into something it can understand and then relate that to the cell so the cell can make a complement of it. Now, what I would like you to do is go to your envelope and pick out one of the filter glasses, red or green, either one, red or green, and hold it on in front of your eyes. And as you're holding it in front of your eyes, look at the screen, it's going to be red or green. Now keep the, keep the glasses on and then tell me, is this a picture of love or fear? When you see this picture, are you living in love or are you living in fear? Love or fear? Yell it out. Love, love and fear. Okay. Are you living in love or are you living in fear? Okay. Now, okay, now go back. Switch the glasses with the other color. Okay, you got the other color on? Are you living in love or are you living in fear? fear. Living in love or are you living in fear? fear? Now the point is take the glasses off. Now here's the truth. This is the truth and this is how simple it is. The world has everything in it. The world has got everything in it. But you can only see what you were trained to see. Your experiences taught you filters. You put the filters on in front of your eyes and you go through your life with a belief that changes the reality into something that you were selecting out of it. If you live in fear and you walk down the street, do you think you'd be interested in the beautiful flowers out here or about that shady looking character over there in the corner? And the fact is, what are you gonna be? You're gonna be looking for things that scare you. Well, if you keep looking for things that scare you, what do you think you're going to find? Things that scare you. And the bottom line is this. The fear generates the reality because the filters only select from that what will pass through your belief filter. So let's say I believe in fear. <laughs> I'm walking down the street, right? And I trip over something. I go, oh, damn it, you know, I'm trying to keep my eyes on the road. I tripped over this thing and took my eyes off the road. I live in fear. But the guy walking behind me, has the red glasses on. He lives in love, right? He's walking, he goes, oh, a block of gold. I live in fear. I cannot see the gold. I'm not looking for gold. I'm looking for fear. And the point about it is taking the glasses on and off is a belief transition, that you can do this. 
You can change your life, but you've got to change the glasses you wear. We have been instilled from our inception with a Darwinian belief that life is a struggle, that survival is based on your ability to fight your way into this life. Well, if that's our belief, then everybody's out here fighting. And the reality is, who are we fighting? We're fighting the belief. We're not fighting anything real. And every day you hear on the news, be afraid, be afraid, be afraid. The glasses get thicker and thicker and thicker. And in the process, your health is going out the window. Whether you live in love or you live in fear is totally a belief. And I can tell you this because I used to live in fear, and that thing has gone totally out the window now. The reality is, as soon as I changed my filters, my life immediately changed. Things started coming to me where before they weren't. And why is that? Well, this is the last four slides. We're getting out of here. I'll get you out of here. Last four slides. And this is a device called a magnetoencephalograph. You've heard of electroencephalographs where you put wires on and you read brain action? Well, the magnetoencephalograph reads the action of the brain but not touching the head. There's a probe above that man's head on the right-hand side, and that probe is called a squid, a super quantum induction device. What does it do? It reads magnetic fields. And what does it reveal? That as you're doing neurological processing, your thoughts are not contained in your head. That your brain waves actually emanate and transmit from your head. Just like atoms and molecules, you're always emitting and absorbing energy. And your thoughts are energy that you send out. It's not mystical or anything like that. It's pretty physical. It's based on a simple rule of physics. It says this, when a current is running through a wire, that if you take your right hand, it's called the rule of the right hand thumb, and it goes like this. If I have the wire and the current is running this way and I take my right hand with my thumb pointing in the direction of the flow and wrap it around the wire, my fingers describe the orientation of a magnetic field around that wire. Nerves are wires. When nerve action goes through the nerves, a magnetic field shown in that orange-yellow circle leaves the head and comes back in again. So basically, your thoughts are broadcast. And now here's the other interesting thing. Now we hook it to this next one, and then all of a sudden you'll see the pertinence of this whole thing. It's like this. The einstein podolsky rosen paradox in the brain, the transferred potential. Let me explain the EPR in just a moment. And it goes like this. That particles in fundamental physics come in spins, and they come in pairs, one spinning to the left, one spinning to the right. And it says if you change the spin of one, the other one will instantaneously change its spin to complement it. So the fact is, the one, if I'm spinning left and I'm spinning right, if I take the right one and start spinning it left, then the left one will start spinning right, because they're complementary. Well, the point about it is this. If I move the particles apart and do it here and change them, they'll still change. And if I move them further apart, they still change. It turns out that you can actually take two particles and move them to each side of the universe, change one particle, and the other one will instantly change. It's called action at a distance, entanglement. And the issue about this paper is, it says it's not just a quantum effect. They take two people. They get them to interact with each other. Two people have never met each other. They get them a chance to hang out, sit down, talk, interact, so they can sort of like bond a little bit. Then they take one of these guys and put them 50 feet away over there in a cage, a wire cage to protect from electromagnetic fields. And they take the other guy and put him in here in a cage, 50, you know, it's 50 feet between the two guys. And they take this guy and flash a light in his eye, which causes what is called an evoked potential. The brain starts to fire with the light flashing. And it turns out, when they get this guy with their shining the light in his eye to, to, to get an evoked potential, simultaneously the other one down there gets the same evoked potential. The point is that the brains are interconnected, that the more bonding that goes on between people, the more interconnected they are. And people who are out here who know have been coupled long enough know frequently that one could have a thought and the other person could respond to it even before you even talked about it. And the reason is this. We are connected by the energy between us. Relevance, the power of prayer. Prayer can be sent to other people and influence their biology. That we can influence health by our belief systems affecting the others around us as well. But that's always wonderful. We always talk about the beautiful nature of the power of prayer. What about the power of hate? The power of hate works the same way. If I hate somebody, I'm connected to them. I can't hate somebody I'm not connected to because I don't know them. So I can hate somebody I'm connected to. But the problem is this. Like the power of prayer, unfortunately, instead of sending good news, I start sending bad news. Well, the response is going to also work itself back. Voodoo is sending bad news, the opposite of prayer, sending ill health 
down this line. What's the relevant? All of us are interconnected. All of our thoughts are not just in our head. Our thoughts are in the field, and they specifically bind to people that we're associated with. So how many of you have frequently said, you know, I was just talking about Bob. I haven't seen Bob in 25 years. Oh, the phone's ringing. Hey, Bob, I was just talking about you. All of us have had experiences like that, and the significance is this. We're all interconnected. Your thoughts are always being connected. And in fact, it's been recently found that, the, you remember those antennas on the surface of the cell? They receive identity. And it's been interesting because people that have received like heart and lungs from people who have died receive some of the characteristics along with the heart and lungs. They used to say, well, it's in the cell memory. And the idea is, look, I'm a cellular biologist. I want to tell you, they don't have neurons and brains like that. There's no way a cell can have memory. How is the memory brought about? Because the identity of the person was coming through the antennas that we are not even in our bodies, that we have antennas on the surface that distinguish each one of us. They're called self-receptors, self-receptors, receivers of self. What does this mean? I try to take my cells and put it in your body, and your immune system says, hey, these are not my cells. Get rid of it. So they're reading identity. And I said, well, where's the identity come from? It comes from these antennas. So the point is this. If I take your cells and cut off the identity re antennas, the self receptors, your cells are generic. They have no identity. I can take your cells and put it into another human. They won't be rejected. I could put it into a mouse. It won't be rejected. I could even take your cells and put them into a chicken. And they'll work without being rejected because they don't have the identity. So where's the identity? It comes in through the antennas. What does that mean? You're not inside the body in the first place. You're in the environment. And when you transplant the organs of a dead person into a live person, these people still have the antennas linked to that identity. So that person is now downplaying through these lungs and hearts or whatever else they are. And now an interesting new one I just read this week. It is really exciting. When a mother is pregnant and the fetus is implanting itself, fetal cells migrate through the mother's system. We used to think that these cells would disappear at birth. They would be lost from the system. Now we recognize they're not, that the mother and her child are connected because they both, the, the mother has the cells of the child in it that tune in to the child's identity. So the mother can tell when something goes wrong with her child, even if they're not connected, because they're on the same wavelength. The relevance of all this is what it hit me, the first thing it hit me, I was non-spiritual. I was an allopathic research medical scientist. I wasn't looking for spirituality. All I was looking at is how does the cell control itself. I saw the membrane and understood that, and then I saw the recognition of the self receptors. And I said to myself, oh my God, I'm not inside of here. I'm playing in the environment. Why? If I cut off the receptors, I don't have identity anymore. And the bottom line is this. If you're receiving an identity from the environment, and what happens is it's like a television set with an antenna on it, but the antenna is tuned to an identity. Here's the issue. You're watching a television show. The television picture tube breaks. What do we say about the TV? It's what? It's dead. Did the broadcast stop? Yes or no? No. How do you know? You can get another TV, put the antenna on it, turn it on, and tune it to that station, and boom, you're back on the air. Point is this. I could take your cell receptors off of your cell and put it onto another cell. I could take my cell cut off my self receptors, take your self receptors, stick it on my cell, and put my, that cell into your body, it's your self. It's, it's not me anymore, it's you. And the point about it is, all of a sudden you start to recognize this, and I said, oh my God, if I'm out there in the environment, then what happens if I kill the cell? It doesn't change me in the environment, I'm still out there. And all of a sudden, I cough. First time in my life, the reality is a spiritual identity. And why this is relevant, it's because the spirit persists whether the body is here or not. And that's what we're recognizing from people who are receiving these large organ transplants, that they're picking up the identity because the cells are still receiving from the self receptors. So there's more to us than this physical body. That biology is on the verge of not only showing us that evolution and creation were simultaneous, but identity exists outside of the body. And that's what allows us to communicate through the atmosphere. And the relevance, ultimately, of that communication simply comes down to this conclusion. Beliefs are created in the brain. The beliefs adjust the body to match the belief. The brain waves are transmitted into the environment. 
so that beliefs are transmitted into the environment and impact those people that we are closest to. The closer you are to somebody, the more impact your belief will have on them. So the relevance is then healing through prayer is understandable. Hurting through bad intentions is also understandable. So the reality is it's a belief system. It's not a gene system. It's a belief system. What's the relevance of that? You can change beliefs virtually instantaneously. Which is larger, the north or the south? South. You see? How long does it take to change a belief? Not a long time. Relevance? Your belief is running your life. If you change your beliefs, you can alter your life. If it's not running the way you want it, change your beliefs and you'll start to see you will bring things into your life. And with that understanding, I, I'd like to close with this understanding for you. You are more powerful than anyone has ever given you credit for. We have lost our power by assigning it to the genes. But I want you to understand, as you've seen tonight, the genes cannot activate themselves. They're responding to the environment, which includes not just the other signals, but the identity of who you are. You carry this into your body when you come here. And the idea about it is this is your life. And the bottom line is this. You can change your life as fast as you can change your beliefs. And your beliefs can be changed almost instantly. And the reality is you are not a victim unless you're just a victim of your belief. And you can change belief. And therefore, when you get up from this, this room and you walk away, recognize as you're walking, you know those thoughts that keep going through your head and all that? Analyze them. Think about them. Why? Because those are shaping your future. Why? Those are the thoughts that are leaving your head and are like tuning forks. They l resonate with things out in your environment. Tuning fork. It's, your brain is a tuning fork. What does that mean? Well, what happens to the tuning fork when it, it causes the goblet to, remove, to start moving, right? So your brain creating events in your life. And all of a sudden, you have to recognize, well, what are those beliefs as you're walking down the street? As psychologists and psychiatrists inform us, approximately 70% of our beliefs are negative and redundant. If we have negative and redundant beliefs, and we're having a tuning fork that is not bringing us good news. It's only going to cause anything to shake that's negative out there in the field. Things that would not, that, you know, everything is sort of like sitting still, but when the tuning fork starts to vibrate, it will cause whatever resonates with it to vibrate as well. So I have a, let's say, 50 people out here, and there are 49 good people and one bad guy. And I start putting out a vibration of fear of the bad guy, fear of the bad guy. So what am I? I'm a tuning fork. Which, which of the people out there are going to vibrate with me? The bad guy. And all of a sudden, the bad guy will be attracted to me. We bring into our lives things because we're not watching that. This is the secret of life. Watch your thoughts because you can create new ones. I know this, I've done it, and it works. And the Caring Center here in town is a great resource to get into recognizing the beliefs and the energy in your environment, how you can alter them, because it's a darn sight more healthy and safe than going through a lot of conventional medical practices to try to do the same. So I leave you with this. You are powerful beyond anything you've ever imagined but then you have to recognize responsibility. And I used to end, I used to end by saying, if you understand everything I just said, then you understand this. You are personally responsible for everything in your life. Well, I used to end that way, and people got so mad at me all the time that I thought, this is not a good ending at all. And in fact, what happened was some woman got so upset she brought her husband in because she was just could not fathom the idea that she was involved in the unfoldment of her life. So we talked about it, and I said, okay, let's, how about this as a conclusion? So this is the new conclusion. You ready? You are personally responsible for everything in your life once you become aware that you are personally responsible for everything in your life. Thank you very much. Thank you.